All right, we're going to go ahead and get started here this morning. Thank you all for coming out to Technology Days. We greatly appreciate it. Look forward to seeing everyone every year. So I'm Jason Gayheimer. I'm the PFR manager here at Bex Hybrids. I've been here for about 11 years now, uh, all of which in practical farm research. So uh, I manage all the PFR locations, and I office here out of the headquarters. And alongside me today is Jim Schwartz. Jim is our director of research, agronomy, and practical farm research. So uh, we're going to talk about three things to consider today. So when Jim sat, Jim and I sat down and talk about what are we going to what are we going to present on for technology days we get a lot of a lot of the same questions over and over and that's what we're that's what we're going to focus on jim gets hit on anything to do with nitrogen all the time uh, he's the nitrogen guru so how can i maximize my nitrogen dollars i get hit with what about planters what about planter attachments i bought a new planter i want to spend money on my planter what should i do so i'm going to cover that a little bit and then jim's going to finish this off with how do i make my spray pass more profitable and then at the end here we're going to have a quiz Okay, so we're going to see how you paid attention and how you all do, okay? So we're going to make this interactive. So get your smartphones out because we need everyone to participate that can. So hit this QR code up here. Don't take a picture of it. Just get your camera on it. It'll bring up a web link. Get to that web browser, but don't touch anything. Don't close it, okay? And as we go throughout our presentation, you can also hit the, hit the posters on the side if you have trouble with the one on the screen. Okay, but as we go throughout our presentation, we're going to keep this interactive. We just got some random questions that we want your feedback on. Okay, so whenever one of those questions pops up on this screen, look at your phone and that question will pop up on your phone and you'll be able to answer it for us. Okay, so keep it open on your phone. Just scan it, leave that web browser open, don't touch anything, and as we get those questions, they'll pop up on your phone for you. And then, like I said, at the end, you'll be able to put your name, nickname in, and we're going to do a quiz and, and see what you learn, okay? So let's do, a, let's do a little test run here. See if everybody, everybody got in. Okay. So now this should be popped up on your three phone. Right answers. And you should be able to answer this for us. So who is your favorite baseball team? Okay. There's three correct answers and one wrong answer. Yep. Let's yep. see how good you are. That may be my question. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So go ahead give and it fill a, it out. Give it a couple yep. minutes. Make sure everybody's getting it figured out. Looks like, yeah, we got a lot of good responses here. <clears throat> let's see where we're at, Jim. No, oh, no. That's, a pro no. that's problematic. No, as look, as long as it's like the Ooh. Twins or the Reds or whatever, I'm fine. <laughs> Cardinals, not good. I just yeah. hope they do better on the quiz at the end mm. than this, right? All here. right. This is pretty bad. So now that the majority of you are kind of upset with us, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. All right, very good. So I'm going to ask you a couple questions as well. Keep your phones out. No right or wrong answers. This just helps us understand a little bit. So here's a question. I'm going to put a cord. How much nitrogen am I going to apply? Put your answer in. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. We just want to get your feedback, see what you say. I want to grow 220 bushel corn. I, I want to apply how much nitrogen? How much are you going to put on? Okay, good. Still a few coming in. Good. Great. <laughs> good. Okay. Second question, true or false? The same rate of nitrogen is the right rate for every field, every hybrid, every year. The same rate of nitrogen is the right rate for every hybrid, every field, every year. That's pretty, this is pretty typical of what we see, and I don't disagree. Now, don't raise your hand, but if I said, how many of you apply the same rate to every hybrid, every field, every year, Right? There's, there be some differences, right? Some of you do that, even though that's the answer. So we'll talk a little bit about that. When I think about nitrogen management, that you can talk nitrogen all day long. Today, we're going to focus on three things that we've studied in the practical farm research that can help with our efficiency. One is split applications. Two, we're going to talk a little bit about anhydrous applications. And then the third thing we'll talk about is some starter studies and some rate studies and understand nitrogen a little bit better. So I'm going to start here. Uh, my wife will tell you, I love Christmas. I love giving presents. And in a few months, hopefully we'll go down and there'll be presents under the tree. Hopefully for you as well. My question is, how many of you at the end of the day on December 25th haven't opened the presents? Probably not many of you, right? You've got a free gift under the tree. You want to open that gift. As it relates to nitrogen, I think there are a lot of us that have free gifts available to us and we're not opening that gift that exists in our soil. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. So split applications. So I'm gonna start here. If you think on the left is the growing season across from planting to harvest. 
Here's what I want you to think about. When you make a decision to apply nitrogen, the further away from, you get from that decision, the larger your margin for error. If I can put some of that decision in season, and if I use the same slope on the lines, my margin for error is a lot smaller. Why? Well, because what's happened from here to here? Stuff has happened, right? The year has happened. And what's happened is I've gathered information and I have a better understanding of the year I'm in and then I can react accordingly. For instance, let's say, heaven forbid, this is the year 2012. I can tell you in Tennessee, Kansas, and Southwest Missouri, there are a lot of guys who will tell you this year has been worse than 2012 and they have bailed or mowed or dissed under their corn crop. What if they had put all their corn, I'm sorry, all their nitrogen on their corn up front? They just wasted a lot of dollar nitrogen. In many cases, if they side dressed, they split ap made a split application, they didn't waste that extra nitrogen. What if it's a year like 2015, where we get two inches of rain seemingly every week? In those cases, I've probably lost a lot of my nitrogen. If I put it all on up front, I'm gonna have to come back and supplement. If I haven't put it all up front, I haven't lost it, I haven't wasted it, and now I can make a decision to supplement differently in season. What if it's a year like 2019 or 2021 where we had fantastic mineralization? So when I talk about that free gift as it relates to nitrogen, that's mineralization of your organic matter. There are years when we have great mineralization of organic nitrogen and the amount of nitrogen that we need is a lot less to grow that bushel of corn. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But by pushing my decision point into the growing season, I can understand that a little bit better. So what's PFR data say? We have a lot of data that helps us make that decision. Here's four-year multi-location data. So the control is basically all our nitrogen up front. Those other two bars are basically two different ways to split my application of nitrogen. That is not insignificant. That data is not insignificant. And you can do this, we could do this study every year, Jason, couldn't we? because every year is a little bit different and every form is a little bit different. But it's for us, it's not just about yield, but it's about being efficient with the nitrogen that we do apply. Don't waste it. Dollar nitrogen, we don't want to overapply. We don't want to lose it. We don't want to waste it. So split applications allow us to accumulate more information and that knowledge allows us to be much more efficient. What about anhydrous? Not as much anhydrous over here, but there is some anhydrous here, especially as we go west much more. What about anhydrous applications? What do we learn? Well, here's what we know about anhydrous when we put it on, okay? Anhydrous is obviously the gas. Anhydrous is ammonia, NH3. It has a very high affinity for water, which is a good thing, because when you put that gas in the soil, that band will expand until it comes in contact with enough water because what happens is it pulls a hydrogen off that water molecule and converts to ammonium. And that's a good thing because ammonium has a positive charge, your soils have a negative charge, and that kind of sits that ammonium molecule, makes it available, and doesn't leach or move out of your soil. But that band will expand until it reaches enough moisture to stop that expansion. If you put your anhydrous in a coarse, dry textured soil, coarse textured, dry soil, that band will expand greater. If you put it in silt loam that has ample moisture, that expansion won't be as great. But that expansion does occur. And so if you think about your depth of application, you want to make sure you get it deep enough so when it does expand, it does not expand into your seedling root zones. When I talk about it pulls a hydrogen off that water molecule, what do you have left out of water if you take a hydrogen away? You have a hydroxyl group. So hydroxyl groups create very, very high pHs. The pH on the outside of that anhydrous band is around 13 to 14. That's pretty toxic in and of itself, okay? So what's our data say? So when we think about the question we get a lot, depth or timing. So this year was a great example of a year when we had to apply our anhydrous and then we had to make a decision about planting. Couldn't wait. So we looked at basically four different regimes. So the two bars on your left are when we applied at eight inch depth. The two bars on your right, when we applied at four inch depth. Then the left bar is when we waited a week to plant after we applied. And then the right bar is when we planted within four days of our application. This data is really clear that if you have to make that decision, depth is key. Depth trumps timing 
almost every time. Depth is the key. Here's what that looks like. This is from our uh, location in El Paso, Illinois. We did not have to hunt too hard to find these plants. So across the top, that's four inch application depth. Across the bottom is eight inch depth. And then on your left is when we did it, it within four days, I'm sorry, on the left, in, and, uh, I'm sorry, within a, a week, sorry, on the right is a more than a week, okay? So you can see when you have to make that decision, depth is key. If you can wait a week and apply at eight inch depth, that's the best. But if you can't, you look at the lower left, eight inch depth is absolutely the driver, okay? Last thing, let's talk about, as it relates to this question, let's talk about nitrogen rate study. So I'm going to ask you another question. So pull out your phones and we're going to keep doing this throughout the presentation. What are your plans for nitrogen this year? What are you thinking about doing? No change? I'm going to cut it less than 25, cut it more than 25. I'm going to use a biological nitrogen product or I'm not going to make any change. I'm going to increase my rates. What are you going to do? Put your answers in here for us. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. It just helps guide what we're thinking and helps instruct us. Good, good. A couple more coming in, good. This is definitely the most common answer we get. No change, it's good. Okay, well let's talk about this. When you take a plant, you grind it up, you include the ear, here's what we know. There's about one to 1.1 pounds of nitrogen in that material. So we know it, call, it takes us about 1.1 pounds of nitrogen to grow a bushel of corn. Now the question is, do you have to put that much on? Do you have to apply 1.1 pounds of nitrogen to grow that bushel per acre? I'll put this statement up here. It surprises a lot of people. Applied nitrogen has very little correlation to final yield. Folks would probably like to argue that, but that is a true statement. Applied nitrogen has very little correlation to final yield. Well, how can I say that? Well, first of all, let's look at USDA data. Those orange triangles there, that's yield. You can see that we have doubled corn yield. Those blue dots, that's, that's nitrogen usage. If I rounded those out, you would find that we have doubled corn yields and our nitrogen use rates have stabilized. We have used no additional nitrogen to double our corn yields. How in the world are we doing that? Here's some individual field data. This is compilation from uh, over 100 fields in, in Illinois. And if you look across the x-axis, the bottom there, that's nitrogen rate. The y-axis, the, the up and down one is yield. You don't really see a big correlation between applied nitrogen and yield. If I drew a regression line, it's pretty flat. In other words, you really don't see, you really don't see a big difference between yield and applied nitrogen. Well, how in the world can that be? Well, we can manage nitrogen by managing a lot of things, rate, timing, source, placement, but I want to, loss, we can manage our loss. I want to talk about that source thing, because when we think about source, we think about anhydrous and UAN and urea, but there are other sources. That's that free gift that exists for a lot of us that we're not thinking about. So here's eight years of practical farm research data, multi-location data. So on the left, that is 50 cent nitrogen. On the right, those two dots are when nitrogen is a dollar. The green dot, is when corn is $6 a bushel. The gray dot is when corn's $3.50 a bushel. This is a very common question we've gotten this year. Okay, nitrogen's gone to a dollar. What should I do with my nitrogen rate? So if you look at this data, in the past, 50 cent nitrogen, our economic optimum nitrogen rate was about 188 pounds, right? So now let's slide over. Now nitrogen's a dollar. Okay, what is my economic optimum nitrogen rate? When corn $6 a bushel, that green dot, it's 183 pounds. In other words, if the bushel price follows the nitrogen, it really does not impact your economic optimum nitrogen rate. A lot of folks think, oh my gosh, nitrogen's a dollar, I should cut back from the perspective of my economic optimum. Not correct. I mean, that, it's a five, five pound difference, really no difference at all. Now, if that nitrogen's a dollar, look at the dot down at the bottom, that's 350 corn. So if corn goes down to 350 and nitrogen to dollar, yep, that impacts your economic optimum nitrogen rate quite a bit. Now it's down to 156 pounds. But as long as the bushel price follows the fertilizer price as it relates to nitrogen, our economic optimum nitrogen rates don't change very much. 
So I'm going to show you some data from 2021. And there's two big take-homes, I think, from this data. So on the left is what has always been our standard PFR proven practice. 30 pounds up front, two by two, followed by 160 pounds. What do you notice about those other five bars? What do you notice about them? What's different about those five bars? Besides the fact that they all provide higher return, all, the, all those five bars, we switched, started putting our nitrogen on in a two by two by two pattern. Okay, that's one thing I want you to take away. Number two is, look at the most economic optimum nitrogen rate and the yield that we grew multi-location multi last year. 253 bushel corn using 160 pounds of nitrogen. Earlier I said, applied nitrogen has very little correlation to final yield. We said it takes 1.1 pounds of nitrogen to grow a bushel corn. Well, how are we doing that? When I talk about that free gift, it has everything to do with mineralization. I'll touch on that in just a second. So we wanted to see, as it related to these nitrogen rates right here, we wanted to go back and say, well, did we have any extra? Did we have too much? So that yellow bar is what universities say at the end of the year, that should be the nitrate levels in the stocks. So we went out and we started chopping stocks and measuring nitrate levels. That's between 700 and 2,000 pounds. That's the range you want to be in. Well, look where we had 160 pounds, the green bar is a nitrogen efficient hybrid. We even at 160 pounds, we grew 255 bushel corn and we had too much nitrogen. Go to 190 pounds, our standard, both the nitrogen hog and the nitrogen efficient hybrid, we had excess nitrogen at the end of the year. Well, how can that be? How can you grow 255 bushel corn, 190 pounds of nitrogen and have too much nitrogen? That comes from mineralization. So let's talk about that for just a second. One acre furrow slice is 6.7 inches of soil. That weighs around 2 million pounds, give or take. Soils are a little bit different. But for calculations, we'll say it's 2 million pounds. That, by the way, is when you get a soil test that has parts per million, what do they tell you to do to convert to pounds? Multiply by two. That's why. So that was 6.7 inches weighs 2 million pounds. If 1% of it's organic matter, how much does that 1% organic matter weigh? About 20,000 pounds. We know that organic matter is 5% nitrogen. So if 1% organic matter is 20,000 pounds, what is 5% of 20,000? 1,000 pounds. So every percent organic matter in your soil, there's 1,000 pounds of nitrogen as part of the organic construct. Now, does that mean that's available every year? Nope. Nope, that process of mineralization will release somewhere between two to 4% of that. And mineralization depends on good oxygen, temperature, moisture, and pH. 2019, 2021, especially during that growing season, we had fantastic temperature, oxygen, moisture, and pH. Once we got past the planting season in 2019, we had really good conditions as far as mineralization and we were mineralizing a ton of nitrogen, 20, 40 plus pounds for every percent organic matter in our soil. I'll share this, this is our Southern Illinois data from 2021, if you look, it's moon dirt. I would say, for those of you from Effingham, I apologize, but you know, it's kind of like farming this gravel right here. It's pretty similar to that, it's hard dirt to farm. And in that year, in 2021, we grew 255 bushel corn with 130 pounds of nitrogen. How in the world are we doing that? That's from that mineralization, okay? And by the way, if you look, we can, we can increase our yields with more nitrogen, but it's not profitable. So how much can I think about? Well, this is really interesting. In 2019, right, University of Illinois had a nitrogen rate study. And this is in Monmouth, so this is high fertility. This is three, 4% organic matter soils, prairie, prairie soils, dark soils but where they applied no nitrogen that year. In that study where they applied no nitrogen in June, which is just, just into the growing season, they were finding 167 pounds of nitrogen in that soil. That's that free gift. That's that gift that's available to us in some years. And by delaying our decision to apply nitrogen, if we understand this, we can measure this, then we can be much more efficient with our nitrogen by understanding mineralization and how much might be available to us. So I talk a lot about, as we think about nitrogen efficiency, understanding mineralization as part of that process is really important. For those of you who use a variable rate nitrogen algorithm to apply your nitrogen, what do you think those algorithms do when it goes over the darkest soils in your field? 
it drops your nitrogen rate. Now, a lot of us go, oh, that's my highest productivity soil. I want to add more nitrogen to it. And those algorithms actually drop your nitrogen rates on the highest organic matter soil because they calculate and make an allowance for mineralization. So I'll make this statement. It's a little bit different, but similar. The fertilizer needs are not really related to your yield level, but they're really much more soil specific. Fertilizer needs are not really related to yield levels as much as they are soil specificity. This is, day, this is the paper released this past October by Purdue University, Dr. Nielsen. Thought this was really interesting. He shared that most soils in the state of Indiana have the ability to provide anywhere from 25 to 50% of the nitrogen your corn crop needs. Now again, does that mean that happens every year? Nope. Nope, there are years if it's hot and dry, cold and wet, cold and dry. If you have those conditions, your mineral, if you have pHs that are out of whack, if you don't have good oxygen levels in your soil, all those things will impede mineralization. But soils have the ability to provide nitrogen. So we think about sources, also think about that mineralization source and understand that delaying that decision in season can allow you to compensate for that. Last slide for me, another source is organic degradation of residue. So soybean residue has a carbon nitrogen ratio of around 20 to 22 to one. Once you get below 24 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio, as that residue breaks down, it releases nutrients into your soil. Corn stalks are much, much higher. So when corn stalks break down, they tie up nitrogen to break down. Corn residue releases nitrogen when it breaks down. So again, this is from that paper at Purdue. It said, hey, on sandy soil, you can conservatively take a credit of 25 pounds. On a silt loam soil, conservatively take a 45 pound credit. So that is another free gift that's available. When I show you our economic optimum nitrogen rate, okay, these are two reasons why that number is where it is. And it also helps you understand how we can grow 255 bushel corn with 160 pounds of nitrogen. Again, am I gonna tell you to go out and do that? No, but what I am gonna tell you to do is if you can, and by the way, I, I completely understand logistics. I get that sometimes manpower dictates that we apply our nitrogen in the fall using anhydrous or price makes that the case. But in a perfect world, if you can delay that process and when, dollars when nitrogen's a dollar, delaying these decisions, accumulating more information is a great way to be more efficient. So Jason, we're doing a lot of different studies, side dress depth, nitrogen rate, nitrogen rate uh, system studies, but this urea coating thing. Tell them a little bit about what we're doing with urea coatings. Yeah, so uh, what we're doing different this year, ESN has been a product on the market for a while, a, a coated uh, delayed release product. And so the top two pictures are just some ESN blended with different ratios of just straight urea. We've got the urea picture on the bottom. The other two on the left and right side of the bottom uh, is a new coating technology called uh, from Purcell. And what they can do is they can do more prescriptive type blends. So instead of being just uh, taking one product that is a certain time day del delay release based on temperature and moisture, they can write a, you know, basically prescription. So if you want a third of that urea coated with a 15 day release uh, coating and then a third with 45 and the other third with 60, they can do that. So more prescriptive blending. So we're doing a 100% pre-plant uh, incorporated trial looking at these different um, prescription type ways of, of releasing that, that urea nitrogen throughout the, throughout the season. So just something different we're trying in terms of, of nitrogen. What I want to focus on for this next segment is planter attachments. And really the whole thing around these first three things I'm going to talk about on planter attachments is robust and uniform root development. Okay, I get asked all the time, how many, how many of you have done something different with your planter in the last five years? Either bought a new planter or done something different, right? We're always constantly upgrading, changing, tweaking that planter, which is great. It's the most important pass of the season. Uh, so I get asked these questions all the time. My top three in this order, and it's always the same, I don't care where you're farming, aftermarket closing wheels, hydraulic downforce, and nitrogen. So nitrogen starter on both sides of the road, two by two by two. And these things all play in together to form that robust uniform root development. So Get your phones back out. This is one that's very important to me. I really want to know where you guys are at with your planner. What type of closing wheels do you have on your planner today? Because I think five or six years ago, the standard, more than 50% of the planners were still two solid rubber closing wheels out there. And I think we've really changed that now. I think that we are more towards the aftermarket wheels more so than two solid rubber closing wheels. And every show so far, that statement has been accurate. And I think, I think it's accurate again today. 
So the, the next question I get when we start moving into that, that aftermarket world, and my uncles actually asked me this two years ago uh, because they were trying to penny pinch and, and save money. Can I just do one aftermarket wheel and leave one solid rubber? Uh, or other people think, well, I kind of still need that one rubber closing wheel to, to finish off closing that, and the other one will crumble. What I don't like about that is it's going to get root development towards the side where you have that aftermarket wheel. Okay, so you're going to get more of your root development going that one direction. It's kind of like when you put starter on one side of the road. You get preferential root growth towards that nitrogen band. We do not want that. So I don't recommend one solid rubber and one aftermarket wheel. These aftermarket wheels are, are made to be paired together. So I'd encourage anyone who's still running the one solid, one rubber to get two, two aftermarket wheels together because that's going to be the best performance. And there's a lot of different ones out there, a lot of different types uh, and that's going to, the one, what's, what's best for you is going to depend on your tillage practice, soil types, and all those different things. But for us, here are the, here are the five, five best ones that we've tested over time for corn. These are our five PFR proven closing wheels, anywhere from two and a half to five bushel gain. So that's why it's my number one thing to do, because you can spend a lot of money on your planter. And closing wheels is one of the least expensive investments on that planter, and you get a pretty good gain across all your acres. So how many of you uh, go out every year, dig, and ensure that you have your closing wheels adjusted properly? Two people? That's not very good. All right, I know more of you do that. How do you do it? You use your finger? Do you get out there and dig with your finger, the seed depth finder, the knife, the pliers, whatever else is in the tractor? Does anybody do it with a flat spatula? I got one. That's, that's one. That's great. Okay, so I'm going to show a video. This is how I would like for you to check. So we're going to take a look today on how well our closing wheels are aligned, how well they're set, and how to properly check to make sure you have everything where they need to be in terms of your closing wheel adjustment, your pressures, and all those things. So best way to do it is not to come out here and take your hand and do this, because when you start doing that, you start losing uh, a real view of what's going on. So the best thing to do is take something flat like the spatula and you want to shove it right down in the ground and then you want to dig a pocket away back away from it okay so we're going to clear it out real nice all the way around the back side of this spatula and then we're going to be able to see a nice window of what things look like so now that we pulled that spatula away, we can see what we're working with here. So these, these closing wheels are, are aligned properly. These are, these are two solid rubber closing wheels. But, but what I want to point out is if they're not, you, you'll, you'll see a remnant of the V. So if you still can see the V here in this little window, uh, then you need to readjust. You either need a little more pressure or you need to uh, adjust the spacing on your closing wheel or the aggressiveness, get a different wheel, these solid rubbers. Here's one of the things that will also happen. So once you do this, you kind of want to feel your sidewall here, okay? And you see how when I feel, it crumbles away at the top, and then we start having where you can really tell where that, where that, those openers were and where that V is, and we really have a, we have a hard compacted sidewall. So I can't even really do it with my finger. I almost need to get to the point, see, we're bringing up chunks here, okay? So now let's go over to an aftermarket wheel. So now we've got the spatula in a different row where we've got two uh, Schaffert zipper closing wheels, aftermarket wheels. They're a little more aggressive. They're going to crumble that sidewall better. So we're going to dig. We're going to do the same method, right? And you want to do this on multiple row, row, rows every year. So the first time out with the planter, you definitely want to do this multiple spots. Look at some different adjustments on your planter and see what, what uh, is working the best. So we're going to dig away from this and we're going to take another close-up look here. So now we pull that away, okay? And we see a similar view. Our closing wheels, we know they're, we, they're actually set proper on this. Once again, you want to make sure you can't see that V. You really just don't want to be able to tell that anything even went through the soil here. Okay. And then, like I said before, the second thing we're going to do is we're going to dig through. Now, look how well this crumbles all the way through. I can eat. I'm just barely, I'm, I'm not even putting any pressure on how well these closing wheels do on eliminating that sidewall compaction and all the way around. We, can't, we have no idea where that, it's actually harder to dig to find your seeding depth and find your seed when you have the better the closing. So how many of you have switched aftermarket closing wheels and then it was harder to check your seating depth? A lot of you, a lot of you raising your hand, right? Because you're, 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 you're eliminating what was visible before. The ideal pass through that field makes it so that it, it, you can't tell anything went through the ground there. That is, that's when you have your hydraulic down force set properly, your closing wheels are set properly. That's the image that you wanna see is that you cannot tell that planter was drugged through that field. 
Okay, so the next one is hydraulic downforce. We're going to hit this one pretty quick, but where are you at with your downforce on your plan? Are you guys using springs? Are you using pneumatic airbags? Or are you at hydraulic downforce? So I'll give you a minute to, to pull in here again. For anybody who walked in late, if you want to participate in this, you can scan the QR codes along the wall uh, or the one on the screen as well. And as we come across questions, they'll pop up on your phone. All right, still got a lot of springs. Okay. All right. Well then, I'm going to I'm going to hit this pretty hard then. Hydraulic fully automated is where I want you to be on your planners, okay? We need to be able to treat every acre, every row the way it needs to be treated with the right amount of pressure, okay? Because we want to make sure we're eliminating compaction. We're not creating compaction with that row unit, but we also want to make sure we have good ground contact so we can keep that uniform seating depth that we're trying to get, okay? So this data I like to show it and just a couple things about it, okay? So this was done in nice uniform flat plots. There's not a lot of variability within this, within this data set here, okay? And so what we did is we took uh, Delta Force fully automated, that's the bar on the left, and we compared that to taking that same hydraulic cylinder and putting it in static pressures of 50, 125, 250, because we were trying, what we're trying to simulate is spring pressures. Spring pressure of 50, 125, 250. But if it would have been springs, those, num those yield numbers for 50, 125, 250 probably would have been worse because we wouldn't be getting as good a ground contact consistently as with the hydraulic cylinders. And so even with that being said, we still have two, three, four bushel gains across these nice uniform plots for fully automated hydraulic downforce. So when you're going across your fields where I know you have more variability than we do, that's going to add up fast. Okay, and this is, a, this is a great image from 2021 at, at, of one of the trials at our Ohio location, fully automated on the left, 125 static pressure on the right. We're never going to be able to pick the right static pressure or the right spring pressure or the right airbag adjustment. We need to be fully automated hydraulic across the board. You can see that we have much, much better plant vigor. They're darker green. They have a better root development system under them already. Uh, in this corn plant's young life. So that's what we're really after there is to, to make sure we're not creating compaction because at that point, the only thing that can pull that back out in that planter pass are those, those closing wheels. And if you create too much, they're not gonna be able to do their job properly either. Okay, so the last piece of the puzzle is starter on both sides of the row. So if you're putting uh, nitrogen on with the planter, I really wanna put that on both sides of the row and this is why right here. Okay, the picture on the far left and that, that, that picture on the far left is 30 units of nitrogen banded one side. That's also a very similar look to what we get when we put one aftermarket closing wheel and one solid rubber together. We, we, we did a lot of root digs when we did that testing, and that's similar results to what we see here. The middle picture is taking that same 30 units and just putting that nitrogen on both sides of the row evenly. And then the far right is upping that nitrogen now that we're putting it on both sides of the row to doubling it and going 60 units both sides. The thing I like to point out here, obviously, we, what, we, what do we want? We want the picture on the right. We want that nice, robust, uniform root mass that's going to benefit a season long. And we can do that by doing all three of these things correctly together. These pictures, all of them have two aftermarket closing wheels together. They all were hydraulic, fully automated, downforce. But the only one that can give us that nice, robust root mass is the picture on the right. The one in the middle is pretty good too. It's definitely not the one on the left. So when you start doing changing things to your planner, you gotta make sure you're not changing one thing that's gonna take away the advantage of something else you just bought, okay? So all three of these things are gonna give you a really good advantage. Uh, but if you're doing one of them wrong, you're gonna pull away from something else that you invested in. So uh, that's why these three are my, the most important for me uh, to be able to, to work well together. This is our day, four year data set for putting nitro on both sides of the row. So the light green bar is just 30 units both sides of the row compared to that 30 units on one side. And then the dark green bars are the double amount, the 60 units on both sides compared to the 30 on one. So you can see really good return on investments here. Very consistent. 2019 was the one year it was down a little bit, right? We planted a lot of stuff late. And honestly, this is one of the very few things in 2019 across all our research that gave us a positive return on investment because of all the other yield limiting factors we had that growing season. So very good, consistent data for these systems. The last question that I get around these is, well, what system should I invest in? And I get a lot of questions on, well, I can buy dribble, dual dribble tubes, dribble on both sides of the row on top of the ground for a quarter of the cost of these systems that are actually gonna put it in the soil. I don't like that. I don't like it on top of the ground. I want it in the soil at all costs. 
Okay, so the, here's, here's one of the systems that are PFR proven for us. I like to make decisions when it comes to planters based off of acres to pay off. I hear way too many times I'll get a call, I really wanna buy hydraulic downforce or this or that, but I don't wanna pay this amount of money. That's just too much to invest in one thing. That's the wrong, that's the wrong way to make that decision because that's just sticker shock is all that is, okay? I want you to do acres to pay off. This is a graph showing 12, 16, or 24 row planter and breaking it down by the, the, what you're selling your, your corn for, either 450, 550, 650, somewhere in that region on how many acres it's gonna take to pay off that investment. This is how you need to look at it, okay? Because this is a no brainer here. Okay, or another good option that we utilize is dual conceal from precision planning. It's probably the most consistent or the most expensive system out there to be able to do this and start it in the soil. Uh, but you can see even on a 24 row planter at 450 corn, it's less than 800 acres to pay off that investment. And then you're gonna be making some serious money off that investment from then on out. So the last thing I, I just wanna hit on is some of the new planter technologies out there. There's, there's companies working on prescriptive seed treatments on the go on these planters, uh, orienting seed on the go on the planter. So a seed orientation mechanism, we've messed around with that a little bit. We've also messed around with autonomous planters. So this is actually a demonstration at our Colfax, Iowa location two weeks ago of a fully autonomous planter. may need to get the auto steer tweaked on that a little bit. But the technology's there. It's pretty interesting to see something like this. I mean, I don't know that I, I don't know that I can envision a day where you drive by a field and there's like four of these out there just planting and nobody's around, right? Uh, but it worked. It'll actually, it actually turns itself around, up and down plants. Um, pretty interesting. Our production guys are actually interested in it because you think about our mail rows when we have to go in and plant mail. Sometimes Mother Nature does something that it said it wasn't going to do, but we still got to get that mail planted and it's wet and it's heavy. And so if we can go in with something like this and plant our mail rows pretty efficiently and not create all that compaction, dragging a bigger, heavier tool through that field, maybe a huge benefit to that. So pretty interesting technologies out on the horizon when it comes to planters. All right, last 10 minutes. Profitable spray pass, last common question we get. We're gonna talk about three things. Time of day to spray, conditioning your water, and carrier rate. So you think about that, those three things, how expensive are they? You may have to get up a little earlier in the morning. You may have to condition your water, that's not that expensive, and water is really pretty cheap. Okay, so these are not expensive solutions to improve the profitability of that spray pass. Let's talk about time of day. Some of you have probably seen this data before. Spraying fungicides or foliar nutrition products, I'm not talking about herbicides, but fungicides and foliar nutrition products in the morning improves your profitability. Now, does that mean <laughs> that you're going to be able to do that. No, we get that. We understand that. But if you have an option, if you have the choice, and you can spray your fungicides in the morning or your foliar nutrition products in the morning, you can improve your profitability. Now, I'm going to show you a chart in a second. It's basically, it's called the Delta T chart. If you're in ag retail, you're familiar with this chart. It talks about the survivability of that spray droplet. We've spent a lot of time talking about how that plant takes it in I want to spend a little more time talking about the droplet itself and the survivability of that droplet. If you have a delta T value above 8 to 10, and this chart, by the way, was created for herbicides, all right, but if you have that above 8 to 10, that's not good because that droplet survival drops way off. As temperatures increase and humidity drops, those droplets shrink and evaporate. As temperatures decrease and humidity increases, you can see it has very slow evaporation. Now, from a herbicide perspective, they don't want this either because that herbicide is available to drift and float around, and so they don't want that. But if I'm spraying a fungicide, what do I want? I want that droplet to survive just as long as it possibly can to drift down in that canopy, to land on that leaf, to spread out on the dew. So I want to be up there and over to the left. That's exactly where I want to be. So a couple, uh, couple months ago, we went out. We said, let's, let's test this out. We're going to go spray some plants we're going to spray water-sensitive paper. So we went out in the afternoon. It was about 87 degrees and about 48% humidity. In the morning, that same morning we sprayed, it was about 70 degrees and 87% humidity. And you can see what happened to our droplet survival when we sprayed in the morning versus when we sprayed in the afternoon. Dramatically different 
So why is that morning so important? Because in the morning, it's typically when temperatures are coolest and humidity is highest. When do frost and dew form? In the morning, right? That's when they form because typically that's when temperatures are lowest and humidity is highest. When you think about that droplet survival, this is data from Ohio State University. A 70 micron droplet is a fine. But again, if we're spraying fungicides, fines are good. Herbicides, not so much. But fungicides, good. If you look at that column, it says 86 DS, all right? That's droplet survival. How long does a droplet survive at 86 degrees if it's a 70 micron droplet? A fine, small droplet. What's the size over there? It's droplet size, zero. It evaporates. We don't want that. We want those droplets to survive and hang around. This is data from a website called dropdata.org. And if you can see, we basically kept the humidity relatively the same. But when you change the temperature 16 degrees, droplet survival increased 10 seconds. That 10 seconds is 10 seconds longer for that droplet to get down in your canopy, land on your leaf, spread out in that dew, and not evaporate or disintegrate. So simply changing your temperature 16 degrees like that improved that droplet survivability 10 seconds. So we went out and prayed. When I showed you those two purple dots, this is what we found. So on the left, this is water sensitive paper. It's yellow. When it gets wet, it turns blue or purple. So on your left, that's the morning application. On your right, those nine, those nine cards, that's the afternoon application. So the rows are the, the leaf above the ear, the middle row is the ear leaf, bottom row is the ear below the leaf, and then the columns are 10, 15, 20, 10, 15, 20. So apples to apples would be comparing this one to this one or say this one to this one. And you can see the droplet survival went way up when we were able to spray in the morning. So this is, this is what we experience. This is why we say spraying in that morning increases that droplet survivability quite a bit. Soybeans, it's not as big a difference, but it's still a difference, okay? It's still a difference. Now, we think that has to do with the canopy density. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. What about conditioning your water? Does that matter? It does matter because hard water is everywhere in the Midwest. Why does it, why does it matter? Because hard water is created by calcium, iron, sodium, magnesium. They are positively charged, okay? When you put a weak acid in your tank, it disassociates. For instance, glyphosate is a great example. It becomes negatively charged. Things like potassium, calcium, sodium, and iron are positively charged. So the negative and the positive bind, that glyphosate will bind with those positively charged cations and basically become inert or ineffective. We don't want that to happen. So we tell you to throw ammonium sulfate in the tank for two reasons. The ammonium binds with the glyphosate, and ammonium glyphosate actually gets into a plant very good, well. But also the sulfate, the negatively charged sulfate, binds with calcium, potassium, sodium, iron, and gets it out of the solution so it's not binding with your negatively charged acid. And that's why we condition water. Otherwise, it's rendered inert. The question is, is it important? If you farm in the Midwest, the answer is yes. That dark blue is hard, very hard water. In fact, when I was doing this research, it said the two municipalities with the hardest water in the United States are Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Indianapolis, Indiana. So if you're drawn from a well, you're drawing hard water. We have a lot of different products that we've used to condition water. And also keep in mind that pH and water conditioning are two different things. Now they can be related, but they are two different things. So understanding pH and understanding water hardness can be different. But here's what I would recommend. Test your water. It's not a hard test to find out how hard your water is. Then when you are mixing, in a perfect world, again, I realize logistics are an issue, but in a perfect world, fill your tank halfway up, add your conditioner. There is a chemical reaction that goes on, so allow the conditioner to actually condition your water. Don't dump your conditioner in and then your glyphosate or then your fungicide, don't do that. Give it, give it a few minutes to actually react, fill your tank up, don't let them sit overnight because those disassociations can reoccur, so don't let it sit overnight because that, that bad things can happen, and then make sure you read the labels. Labels are very specific. Last topic, fungicide carrier rate. All right, pull your phones out in a minute. We're going to have that knowledge check again, but pull your phones out. I'm curious, what is your fungicide carrier rate? And I realize I actually should have said for corn or soybeans, but uh, let's just say, what's your fungicide carrier rate? 15, 20, good. Good. Perfect. 
Good. Okay. Good. Here's what our data says. For corn, really no big difference between 15 and 20 gallon. Either, either works. That was interesting. Uh, two weeks ago, I did a presentation, this presentation, Henderson, Kentucky, and I had an independent ag retailer come up to me and say, I don't spray anything. Herbicides might be an ex exception. He says, I don't spray anything unless I'm using 25 gallons. I'm like, man, do you really want to tender that much water? And his comment to me was, my performance, the performance of the products I apply, when I, when I use 25 gallons of water, it's worth it. Because he said, I have, don't have respray, I don't have problems. So he uses 25 gallons. Our data says 15 to 20 on corn is enough, but that was what he does. How about soybeans? Our soybean data would say 20 gallon. And if you think about it, that soybean canopy is so much more dense, it's harder to penetrate, so 20 gallon of water is probably more effective. Now, the other thing, a couple questions we get when we get about carrier rate is, well, does spraying in the after and time of day, does spraying in the afternoon not work? Nope. Spraying in the afternoon does work. But if the question is, how do I make that spray pass more profitable, spraying in the morning is better. We realize folks can't go out and spray everything in the afternoon. But, and it does work. But spraying in the morning is better. The second question we get was, if this carrier rate stuff was so important, what does that mean about my airplane? Should I, does airplane, do airplane applications not work? And the answer is they do work. We really, there's no way we could cover all the acres. We, we did a trial this year where we did airplanes versus high clearance machine versus drones. And the pilot told us he was 100,000 acres behind on applications. We know we can't get over the acres without the use of airplanes. It does work, but again, the question is, how do I improve it? You can improve it by adding gallonage and water is pretty cheap. Here's paper that we use where you can see the water sensitive paper, better coverage using the higher rates. Okay. Jason, we've got a couple corn plants to share. This is the last thing we'll talk about before we do our quiz. So get your phones back out, join on. We've got a couple different corn plants. So we're doing three different trials. That is a fully mature corn plant. It's not been stressed. This is a regular corn plant. One of the things we're trying to understand as it relates to short corn, this is a new, a new idea coming out of the market. Does that corn plant require less carrier rate to cover it? Does it need less nitrogen? There's a lot less biomass. Does that plant need less nitrogen? And does that plant respond differently to row width and population? We're doing a lot of work, but that is something that we're trying to understand about short corn. You will hear lots and lots and lots more in the future about short corn. Understanding things like carrier rate, nitrogen, row width, and population could be impactful. So go ahead, join the quiz, put your name, your initials, whatever you want to do. Jason's going to take you through our five question quiz. Very good. Let's get going. It's two, it is two, oh my goodness, it's 2.15. Where's the day gone? All right. Well, welcome everybody. We are pleased to have you join us this afternoon. My name is Jim Schwartz. I'm Director of Research Agronomy and our Practical Farm Research Program here at Bex. I'll do some introductions, then we're going to have you all do the, the heavy lifting for this session. So with us today, Steve Gauck. Steve is Regional Agronomy Manager for our Eastern Region, which basically is from, oh, Upper Michigan down to Louisiana and Indiana, that, that, it's a big region, all right? <laughs> Jason Gayheimer, Jason is our PFR manager. Jason lives in Cicero here, just south, and works here out of the Atlanta office. And then John Skinner is our regional agronomy manager for our central region, which is Illinois, Missouri. He's also the mayor of Atkinson, Illinois. So he's not, but uh, anyhow. So uh, John lives in Atkinson, Illinois. So what we're going to do is a couple things. There is a QR code that you see up there. If you're shy and you don't want to ask a question, you don't want to raise your hand or don't want to holler it out, you can use that QR code, send the questions to me, and I will ask the questions of the group. Or if you're comfortable, we have two gentlemen with microphones right there, and you can just raise your hand. They'll bring you a microphone. We'd love for you to speak into the microphone, or they can repeat it for you if you'd like to answer your question. But we've got about 45 minutes where we're going to answer your questions and cover whatever's on your mind. So we can talk about Colts, Cubs, and Pacers. Sport? No, I'm kidding. So I don't have to do that. But anyhow, what's on your mind? What do you want to talk about? This is your show now. Raise your hand. Holler out a question. Right there. Hang on. He's going to bring you a microphone. Uh, with all this cover crop application, um, well, I'm going to tell you my age. We used to dump clover or plow down 
into 28 when we top dressed the wheat and we had a beautiful stand of clover come harvest. Why can't we do that with cover crops? Why do we have to have all this special equipment? Why can't we just dump the seed into a tank, spray it on? Everybody hear the question, okay? You used to put clover in 28 and just broadcast it. Why can't we do that? Steve, you use cover crops on your farm. Why can't we do that? So I, I guess I, I still struggled hearing the question. I hear the music over okay. there in the conditioner. So he said, he said um, they in the old days, he said they used to just put take 28, put clover seed on it, broadcast it in their wheat, and then they would have a beautiful clover stand. Mm -hmm. Why can't we do it that way? Right. So um, I actually got a neighbor that does that. Actually, that's all he does. He frost seed clover into his wheat and then uh, rotational grazes cattle on it and then goes back into it. He's all no-till. So there are some options, right? We've been looking at uh, some side dress equipment that actually will broadcast cover crops on as you're side dressing corn. The challenge is with some of that in-season stuff is shading, right? We're trying to seed it early, get a start. Then we end up at later in the season, we can't get through the canopy to get stuff to the ground to get it there. Um, I think, Jason, am I, am I dreaming? Did we have some robots that did some cover crops <laughs> in here a couple years ago? They kind of did. They kind of <laughs> did? Yeah. So, the, so the technology is there. We're getting there, right? It's understanding what what do we need, what don't we need, but... but to me, it's simple, right, man? If I could just somehow get over that corn and get some clover down in there, it's getting through the canopy, then get enough sunlight to get going. So sometimes our residual herbicides have caused some issues, but um, you know we're chasing the we're chasing the combine with the um, with a cover crop seeder. Now I just talking to a guy out front here. They've put a whole system on their combine with a seeder on the back of it. Took the ladder off as a seeder. They're blowing it in under the head as they're shelling and. Um, they, they're having fantastic luck with that, getting it underneath the residue and getting a good, a good start. So hmm. we're trying, all right? There's, it, it's not, yes, PFR. There you go, Jason. There you go. Right? You know the old <laughs> saying, everything old is new again, right? In about five years, we're going to go, why don't, we, why don't we seed clover with 28? Yeah. Let's try that, right? Yep. But no, it's a good question. What else is on your mind? Other questions from the group? I've got a few on here, but what's on your mind? What do you want to talk about? All right, I've got one here. Uh, John, what should I expect from Tar Spot this year? Okay, uh, from what I've seen in the area I cover and, and talking to my counterparts across the region, we haven't seen a, a big outbreak of Tar Spot yet. I mean, we have some where I live there in Northern Illinois starting to show its head this year. Uh, but a lot of the corn we've looked at, a lot of the corn I've walked and talked to guys, we're, we're R5, we're at Dent or later. Don't have a huge infestation of tar spot. I wouldn't expect too much, if any, yield loss from it this year. May may speed up our maturation a little bit. We may slow the plant down a little bit from from a photosynthetic aspect. But we're our corn plants are fairly healthy this year. And the year we've had big losses from tar spot, it's because we've had other issues looming, stalk integrity, crown rots, things like that, that have exacerbated the cause of tar spot. You made the comment that. Uh, our plants are healthier this year. Does that matter as it relates to tar spot infections? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's uh, anytime a plant is healthier and happier, it has a higher uh, disease mitigation principles to it. And uh, so if it's healthy, if it's happy, it is less prone to get disease. It's no different than us as humans. You know, if you're tired and worn down, you're more likely to get sick than as if you're, if you're healthy and have a good diet and, and all that stuff. So, yeah, it definitely matters. Let, let's say, uh, and, and I'll go with you, Jason. We'll start here. We've got some PFR information. Let's say I, my corn's at still an R1, late planted field, and I start to see tar spot. What's PFR say is as far as too late to actually spray a fungicide? And then, John, I'll come back to you on that. And we've got a couple questions on, that have come in online. Yeah, so so we're, we're doing foliar fungicide timing studies where we're starting anywhere for as early as V10 and going all the way to R4. And so I think all the way to that to that R4 when you're trying to, to control tar yeah. spot. So if you start seeing it R1, you, be, you better start putting something on it. And um, hopefully you've got enough residual to, to get you through um, or you're going to have to do maybe a second a second shot and you can you can run that later than R1, R2, R3, maybe even R4. But, um, you know, John, I think I think come come late R4, that's that's about it. Yeah, and, and we saw that a little bit in some trials last year. We got all the way out to R4. Which is? R4 oh, means dough stage. <laughs> dough. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Our sport is those stage. Lunch was real good, wasn't it, John? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've been up here for a while today. Uh, and we saw good results, even all the way up to R4. So a lot of times, if, if a concern is tar spot for, for a customer or for a farmer, and that's high on their radar, and we're clean at tassel, I'm going to push that application back till I start seeing something or till we get to R3. And if we're still clean at R3, then I'll pull the trigger then uh, on the fungicide to catch the tail end of that residual moving forward because there's no disease out there at that time i feel pretty confident we'll have pretty healthy plants all right and by the way if you just joined us you can use that qr code scan it and ask your question remotely we've got a couple questions that have come in uh before i do that are there any questions out there any questions you've got don't hesitate to raise your hand ask question holler it out anything on your mind right there's one right here you go bring your microphone right there is uh Pivot Bio, is that going to be available yep. in other forms next year? So the question is Pivot Bio Proven. We have another question on here, opinion on Pivot Bio Proven 40. So do you know about new forms, which I don't know of new forms, but what's uh, Jason, Trista. I'll start with you uh, as far as Trista, right? yeah. opinions on Pivot Bio. We've, we tested it one yeah, year. Yeah, Tell yeah, them a little so bit about it. So in that, in that biological space, that nitrogen fixing biological space, we've tested uh, Source and Vita. We did test Pivot the first year it came out, but it wasn't. It was before. It was the first version. It wasn't uh, proven forty or whatever they call it now. Um, the problem with some of these 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 technologies is, you know, I, I, the science is there in a controlled lab environment. I'm sure it works every time. Uh, when we get out into the field and into other conditions, and and those things change, and how we have to handle them, and all the the conditions that those products get put through, especially if they have living organisms in the product. Uh, similar to to Pivot Bio, so storing how you apply, when you mix, when you apply, compared to mixing, all those things are very very critical. Um, so those things come into play. What we've seen is very, I'm gonna say, inconsistent results at best. And we and I've also this has been a hot topic, right? So we've talked to a lot of growers over all the field shows we've had here in August, and and I get mixed results with the growers too. A lot of growers have tried it. And I get some that say, "Yep, I, I've seen a good response," and I get the same amount that said, "I saw nothing." Um, so it's just, it's pretty inconsistent. I think we got to figure out how to test them better. Uh, I think, I think they need to become, we need to figure out how to make them more reliable. They're just inconsistent at best. And, um, so right this year we're looking, we're testing source and Vita and Utricia in. So Utricia ends from Corteva. So, so we don't actually have pivot 40. Um, but we do, we do, we are testing all the others. So, but similar results to all of them. It's just, it's, it's kind of inconsistent. We're trying to figure out those patterns and the reasons why it works here and there and, and not here or, or just different years and different environments, different conditions. Yeah, one of the things uh, I always say is if this is everything there is to know about biologicals, I think this is about how much we know. You, may, I don't even think we know how to test them properly. I'll give you a couple things. So think about Pivot Bio, for instance. What it does is it stimulates the biological activity in your soil and it recreates that and helps that, in theory, fix nitrogen, right, in your soil. But once nitrogen is in your soil, what does it have to do? It has to get into your plant. That, that biological also has to compete with all the other biology that exists in your soil. So I, our comment is, and I share, I'm sure when they test it, they probably test it in a sterile environment to see if it works. But once you put it in the, the, the environment that we're trying to farm, it has to compete with a whole host of other things. And so the results tend to be a little more variable. I, I would say I've heard this now a couple of times that maybe they tend to see better results in a corn after corn application, which might make sense, or maybe a more coarse textured soil, but it's it's variable at best. Yeah. Anybody else on Pivot Bio 40? I disagree. I, I think uh, what you guys said is all true. I've seen it on some thinner, less productive soils, and it seems to have a more of an advantage than what it does on like a heavy black right. soil. So I yeah. think some of our nitrogen stress soils, some of our thinner, less productive soils, we may see an advantage over that, over what we've seen on some flatter, blacker, higher productivity stuff. That, Just because of the mineralization yeah. factor that, that soil has versus the, the yeah. lighter stuff. Yeah, I, and I think our recommendation is don't go hog wild with them. If you want to try them, try them. Um, you can try a couple strips with just adding them to your current program or maybe reduce a little nitrogen and, and add it with that. But don't, you know, our recommendation right now from what we've seen and messed with is Probably don't go across a lot of your acres. Just try it. But it, I think it's worth trying. I think the product's worth trying on your farm, seeing if you get a response, but do some test strips on, on some of your acres. 
All right, I got a question online. Steve, I'll start with you, Jason, go to you. What products do you believe are best to use for Inferro Row Starter? You have a favorite, anything you use, then Jason will come to you, or Jason, if you want it first, what, from the PFR perspective, we've got a couple PFR proven products, but yeah, yeah, I think it's a little bit right. Well, is you know, obviously they've got a planner set up for it, so we look at those opportunities. We've done some sugar in yeah. Furrow, had some good results. I, I think sugar is kind of interesting. It seemed to be better results later planting them, and soils are warmer, more microbes to feed. Uh, but one thing that really jumps out to me in the PFR proven products that are in Furrow for corn. They all contain potash. That seems to be something that triggers success with Inferro products and PFR on corn. Soybeans, a little bit more of a mixed bag. We've, we've tried some things. I like sugar, chelated calcium in the furrow, but even that hasn't been consistent necessarily in PFR. Uh, we've got one PFR proven Inferro product for soybeans. That's a fertilizer. But I'm not sure long term that Inferro will be used for fertilizer. I think it'll be used more as a biological application, more, you know, some, some micronutrients maybe. I think there's going to be some different things. Obviously, we got some insecticides, but I'm almost thinking we got to step away from thinking of it as a fertilizer program, more as some additional things and look at our two by two by two system yep. to deliver fertilizer. Yep. Yeah, yeah I, li said, I like the two by two by two for that nitrogen, that sulfur, the bulk load of those. Um, and then I agree with Steve. I think the future of Inferro, and, and that's why we do, if you look at our book, every year we have what we call a starter additive Inferro study. So we've got a couple starters that were really consistent for us on corn, so a 6246 and a 9189. And so what are the other things that there, there's so many products that are being developed that that's the platform to apply them is Inferro. So, you know, there's so many of them. We're just trying to take a look at whether they're protection products, biologicals, nutritionals. What are those things that can be added in that? that planter pass in furrow. And I, and I agree with Steve. I think that's, that's going to become more prevalent of what are the other things that can go in that pass. John, anything else? No, I have nothing else to add on that topic. All right. Well, here's one that came in. Do you think 30 inch rows suffered more than 15 inch rows this year on the hotter, drier days we've seen? I'll assume soybeans, but uh, <laughs> John, we'll start with you. Uh, Cause we've got 15s and 30s here on corn, but uh, we'll start with you, John. I don't believe so. From from what I've seen in the area I've covered with the heat, I don't believe the 30-inch roads suffered more than the 15-inch roads. There's two things that come into play here. 15-inch roads are going to have a little bit more uh, earlier canopy. They're going to have more moisture retention within the row. But at the same time, a 30-inch row bean is going to have a cooler canopy temperature. Both in influence uh, uh, yield, obviously. So. I haven't seen a whole lot of 30-inch beans take it worse than 15-inch beans or, or vice versa. Um, the area I cover is going to be fairly good on bean crop. So, so I, I think as harvest rolls, I might disagree. Uh, and, and part of – I agree with what you're saying Different about the canopy. Too, yeah. Different environments for you yeah. two guys. Well, sure. absolutely sure. Yeah. right. But, yeah. but I think about nodulation on soybeans. And I think about soil temperatures needing to be at 70 to 74 degrees to maximize nodulation. So when I get into these wide rows and we got hot in June and our 30s weren't quite canopied yet, I think we got our soil temperatures warm enough that we could have affected nodulation. And when we go into grain fill, I could see where the 30s might get set back. Now, if it keeps raining, we'll probably be fine. But for us being a little bit dry, yes, our canopy temperature got warmer, but I think we kept our soils a little cooler. So when I dig plants, I see good nodulation on my 15-inch row beans. So Grain fill may all wash all that out if it keeps raining, but for us, that cooler soil temperature in the narrow rows, I think, is going to offer us an advantage. Yep. I'd, I'd, I'd agree with Steve a little bit there too. I mean, a lot of the beans in John's area probably did canopy. Eventually, we still got some 30s that didn't yeah. canopy all yeah. the way here, yeah. so but we got pretty dry, pretty dry. And so I think, you know, more often than not, I think John, you're right. But this year, in certain pockets, especially here, I mean, we there's some there's some 30s that don't look real good because they just didn't can't fully canopy, so. Go back out here. Questions out here? All right, right there in the middle, we got one. He's going to bring you a mic from the right. So with inferral fungicide, are you going to have a good test this year against tar spot since it's not showing up near as much? Okay, inferral fungicides. Correct. And did it? Two by two. Two by Sorry, two. Sorry, two by two. Probably thinking Zyway. And then does it help on tar spot, right? Tar spot. 
Who wants uh, John? I'll go first. Yep. So <laughs> we're back to corn. Here goes John. Yeah, we're talking about corn. Now. I get excited. Uh, Zyway Infero Fungicide or 2x2 two two is not labeled for tar spot or southern rust. And I don't think we'll see a big uh, <clears throat> reduction of the incidence of those two diseases on it. But what I think it can do is I think it can get you. We talked about getting past that VTR1, and if we're still clean, maybe pushing back our fungicides a little more. I think it'll definitely get you there with your gray leaf spots, your northern corn leaf blights, your anthracnose stalk and leaf blight uh, in those situations. So I've seen some pretty cool stuff out of Zyway as far as keeping the plant clean. Ground and we've blood. tested it a couple of years. Jason can touch on the data yep. on that. But tar spot, southern rust, I wouldn't rely on that for season-long control. No. By Zyway. I agree. And I think it goes back to what you said earlier, John, about uh, being healthier getting before you get yeah. infected, right? So I think what Zyway will do is it, it's not going to control tar spot um, or southern rust, but what it will do is it'll help keep that plant healthier. And we've seen that. We've seen that both years we've tested it. Whether that always correlates to higher yields, you know, sometimes it may just correlate to better standability, better stalk strength. We've seen that. Um, and then just keep the keeping that plant healthier longer. Uh, is what that's really, I think that's where it's really going to shine. So it'll just be, it, it instead of tar spot maybe taking that corn down in five days, it, it may, it's going to give you a, a longer period to try to rescue that corn versus it's just gone if you have severe infection. When I think too, you know, we're thinking about the, the label on Zyway for Infero is most likely going to get pulled. So it's going to be a two by two application. And, and so Jason said, we're studying, we got two by two, we've got dribble out the back, two by two. Too. So we're looking at that, but but for the east, I you know obviously I'm worried about tar spot, I'm worried about southern rust. But for the east, where Zyway is offering us such an advantage is crown rot. So we think about our wet soils, our tight clays. We ended up in that crown of that plant early on getting an infection that later causes premature plant death. It causes some small ears, stainability. It's really seemed to have a great effect on crown rot and your wetter, tighter clays. So that's where, and even in the two by two or the dribble versus in fro, been very strong. So that's where my excitement comes because then that plant's healthy enough, I get to worry about Southern rust in some areas. Yeah, great question, great question. Okay, go. Uh, we live in an area where we like to apply quite a bit of phosphorus at planting in a two by two or a two by two by two. Um, but knowing a 1034-0 is, I don't know what, 40, 50% actually available to the plant. Have you guys done any research in terms of replacing any of that 1034 with an ortho? Yeah, um, so ortho versus that, poly. But putting that in perspective of where you might damp yourself in actual fertility versus just getting that plant off to a better start, if you know what I mean there. Could you hear it? Okay. Kind of. No, couldn't hear it. Sorry. Uh, it's, be, it's so hard I to know, hear it. Well, we got an air conditioner unit back here. Ortho versus poly. That was part of it. And then the other part was just in terms of where, if there's a cutoff or a issue where running, replacing all of that poly, that regular 1034 with an ortho type product. I know like a Nutrinet, like a, a black label type product, or um, I guess a, more of a humic based product like that. If there's a big killer when it comes to longevity and like soil fertility versus, um, you know, if you replace all yep. that poly with an ortho. It, so his question really is, let's start with poly versus ortho. And then I think the second question is, can I just go all ortho or do I need to use both in my rotate? You know, did, can can I use both? Should I use both or can I just go 100% ortho? So Jason, you want to talk a little bit about our PFR proven products that are right. ortho. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we, we've got the, the six Anderson's has a 624, 600% ortho. It's proven. Real good consistency out of that. Nature's 9189 or something mm -hmm. around there. Or, or, uh, I can't remember the exact analysis, but they've got a product very consistent that's proven for us. Uh, what I like is I like putting uh, blending UAN and 103040 and sulfur. That's like my favorite combo. And putting that two by two by two and keeping that 100% ortho product. You know, if you're going to run a 6246 or whatever, keeping that in furrow on the seed. So I, I like a mixture of both ultimately. Um, but that's that's where I like to place them. Anybody? I think your cost factor with going 100% ortho. ortho. It, I mean, in the in the presence of moisture and adequate temperatures, your <clears throat> breakdown of poly versus ortho could be less than 60 hours. So, I'm not too concerned about it in that aspect. Running a 
running a polyphosphate product. And that's kind of some of the research I've been reading too, kind of shocking, right? That the poly doesn't take as long to break down as we thought, just like John said. So ultimately I like the ortho in, in furrow, right? We don't need a lot. It's, it's immediately available. That plant can take it up. And then you know, I start looking at the poly for the two by two by two system. Like Jason, I like the 10340 mix, you know, and based on your soil test, right? I think we're seeing too, that if your pH is balanced, you're planting into some good conditions, even at the two by two by two, right? There's, there's, there's always gonna be a need for phosphorus because it establishes a grass, but on the flip side, you know, how far do we need to push that? We, we, at home, we've pulled it completely out. We're straight 28 in our two by two by two. And the yeah. only poly we go is obviously our dry, or I mean, our, our, our phosphorus only is in furrow or our dry. So it's, um, you know, as we understand that a little bit, it's, it's for grass establishment. So I'm comfortable with the mix of both. Yep. And if you're, I get this question a lot, should I run, should, if I've got a choice, should I run in furrow if I'm not gonna do both? Should I run the pop-up in furrow, the, the ortho, or should I run the nitrogen or 1034-02 two by two? And I, you know, we debate this all the time and talk about it. I like going, nit making sure I've got some nitrogen, some UAN, and then if you're gonna put 1034 in there or sulfur, I like two by two by two. We get better bang for our buck, more consistency than what we get out of our, what am I call pop-up in furrow starters. So those can be good too, but we just get a, seems like we get a more consistent, bigger bang for our buck with the two by two by two, higher loads of nitrogen. Um, maybe the 10 foot 34. I, I think too with, with phosphorus, we, we always talk about phosphorus needing early in the season, ortho versus phosphorus or uh, poly and things like that. Phosphorus in corn is a late season nutrient. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we get to R2, we've only taken up about 45 to 50 percent of the total phosphorus needs of the year. Okay, so we need it later in the season, more importantly than, than anything. So I wouldn't sacrifice all my phosphorus to go up front in a liquid formulation when we need. Yep a steady reservoir for late season grain fill and development. He's right. And but having said that, the, if you're going to use it early, the odds for a positive response go up. If it's cold, yeah. if you no-till, yeah. if you have poorly drained soils, that's when the odds for a response go up. Good so mm -hmm. good, good feedback. Yeah. We've got a couple questions that have popped through as well, but anything else out here before we go to these? My voice. Let's do some fungicide questions. Uh, we'll start with the bottom one. Jason, do you have any plots showing two passes of fungicide on corn? If so, what did it show? Uh, so yeah, we've done we've done dual uh, dual passes before. Uh, a couple of things I want I want to preface first. So when you look at our fungicide data, uh, usually it's fairly muted compared to everyone around field scale. And what I mean by that, it's usually three to five bushel less of a gain for fungicides in our plots, because you think about we're smaller, we have grass alleyways, we don't have end rows, we got more air movement, we just don't have the disease pressure and inoculum that a, a field does. And so we still see great results, don't get me wrong. Um, but, and we also, most of the PFR farms don't, we, we haven't dealt with really heavy, really heavy tar spot. And uh, the times we've done the, the dual applications, we didn't necessarily have Southern rust real bad or anything super prevalent. So, so in our data, if you look at any of our data where we've done the two shot approach, it's, it's always showed that one shot at R1 has been the best, uh, but that doesn't mean that's how that's going to translate to field scale scenario. So have you ever seen John or still start John? Have you ever seen where two shots has paid off in the field? Yeah, actually last year in, in a lot of parts of Illinois, when we had a tassel application followed by a R3 application, it was beneficial, but we had a lot a lot of disease pressure from tar spot later in the season. Um, it wasn't a huge advantage to, I mean, guys sprayed R3 one time and then VT and R3 was a slight advantage, but R3 and VT versus just VT was a huge advantage. So uh, yeah, we've seen it, we've seen it pay in the, in the presence of severe disease. And then I don't think you touched on it, but we do have, Zyway followed up by yep. R3 application yep. of Lucento that was also pretty profitable uh, last okay. year in PFR. Yep. Yeah, so for me, um, I have seen it pay a couple times now. More, I, I grew up more in the Southern aspects, so same way with Southern Rust. Back in 2016, when it came in early, had to shoot it early, shoot it late. Um, but we also, in the past, have had some hybrids. We talked about crown rot earlier. So it, it, we plant some hybrids at home that are a little more susceptible to crown rot because we pull a premium on them. And so we make a fungicide application early V4, V5 to cover that crown rot before Zyway came out and then made a post application later. Now in the PFR book, it shows that doesn't pay, but ultimately in the PFR book, remember we're using all branded 
um, fungicides. So we got some opportunities there at that V5 application to play with some generics. Now we're targeting specifically crown rot and that's been, that's been profitable for us, but it's, it's pretty limited acres or opportunities that two passes of fungicides will pay. Yep. Other questions out here? We've got one on the screen, another fungicide question. Other questions out here? We got one here, Jim. Uh, all right, he'll, he'll bring you a mic right there. On your split on your split applications of fungicide, are you doing a full rate on both passes, or are you able to back the rate off the first pass and maybe a full rate the second pass? Yeah, the question was full rate both times, or did we test half rate, full rate? Go so ahead. We, we've tested both ways, um, especially that we used to do a lot of that V5 versus VTR1 and combination testing and. Uh, a lot of times when we were doing that, it more often than not we were doing the half rate up front and with the full uh, full rate in the, on the backside there. And uh, to, to Steve's point, the you know we do use branded fungicides in, in PFR. We see just much better results with them. multiple modes of action, a good quality branded fungicide. I know they cost more, but a lot of times that's why we don't. That's why we see one shot be the most profitable. A lot of times we're putting a lot of money into that one shot. It's a good product, multiple modes of action, and. And we don't have quite the disease pressure that, that you, a lot of you guys have in, in some of your fields, too. So, Anything else out here before we go to the one on the screen? Let's expand this a little bit and, and talk about spraying fungicides on corn or beans when it's hot and dry. Should I do it? And uh, probably we ought to differentiate between dry versus drought here, but uh, who wants it? Well, I think, and Jason can allude to this a little bit, right? I think about, I think about you know, from a soybean standpoint, I think about double crop beans, it's normally dry, right, with double crop beans, but yet it's, it's very profitable in PFR studies on double crop <clears throat> beans to spray fungicide. So it, drought is one thing, right? Dry is another. So when it's dry, you know, we think about the strobular inside of a fungicide helping with some plant health, helping to delay ethylene production, right, which causes plants to start to ripen, you know, when it's just dry, maybe I can hold that plant through it. Now, if I'm in a true drought, I'm probably going to kill the plant because I'm, I'm overstressing it by trying to get it through that. But dry and late, we actually see fungicide profitability go up for later planted soybeans. And most of the time those are dry, but it's more profitable because of the heat and disease, the timing of when disease comes in. Why does that fungicide work on corn, since you hate beans, why does the fungicide work on corn when it's dry? I thought it's just controlling diseases. No, Steve alluded to it there a little bit. A fungicide can help suppress ethylene production in the corn plant, which is a, it's a ripening hormone. Uh, it also increases lignification in the plant, so our, our, our stalk can get a little bit thicker. Uh, it also helps in some situations with, with water use and water efficiencies, uh, stomatal control, things like that. So there's a lot of factors outside of disease mitigation that a fungicide, especially the strobularin class and even the SDHI class uh, of fungicides can help with. What, anything else from out here in the group? Okay, this one just popped in. Uh, Jason, have you done any fungicide insecticide applications, helicopter versus ground? Clayton just walked out. Yeah, that was his question, out. man. I know. I know. Uh, so helicopter versus ground versus, let's even touch on drone. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we don't necessarily have the area. I'm, I'm just going to say aerial versus ground on soybeans. Uh, been a pretty hard, uh, elusive study for us. We actually, actually attempted this multiple years, and something always went wrong. Either we couldn't actually get the helicopter to show up at the field or the plane at the time we needed to do it, or something got sprayed wrong. Uh, very hard to coordinate these trials. But Clayton Stuffelbeam, he's a PFR agronomist for us in West Central Illinois. We've got about six or seven of these field-scale trials now where we have uh, aerial versus ground uh, on corn. Uh, don't have any trials on beans with that. Um, I, more than likely, we're probably going to be doing some trials – with drones, I think. I think that's starting to be a little more common. Now, I don't think it's a, a thing where you're going to go out and buy your own drone and try to spray your own acres because they'll take you forever. Uh, but there are a lot of guys investing in a bunch of drones and starting their own business and going around and, you know, releasing a bunch of drones into a field. And that, that can that can work pretty well. I'm hearing a lot more of that. So we do have aerial versus ground uh, corn data that we will hopefully successfully pull off this year and be able to show that. And then um, I think next year we'll maybe do some work with the drones. We can do the drone work, drone versus ground, in the plots. 
Uh, so that'll be a little easier for us than have to take some of that field scale. So, Jason, in our talk over there, we talked a lot about carrier rate and time of day to spray. But does that mean that spraying with a plane in the afternoon is unprofitable? No, no. I think I mean, it's it's still profitable. Um, ultimately, if I have a ground rig, I really want to try to use my ground rig, get my ground rig across my acres uh, to be able to, to get better coverage to and be able to time it when I want, right? Make sure I hit the right growth stage, the right timing that I want the right carrier rate, uh, be able to try to spray as many acres in the morning with a dew on as possible. Those, li those little things that you can then control by doing it yourself are going to add up versus calling a plane and they show up when they show up. So, you know, one of the reasons this, these studies are so hard to do is we're lucky we pulled it off this year because the, the, the company and the pilot that, that helped us <laughs> with these trials, they were 100,000 acres behind and they were screwing around helping us with these trials. So we were very grateful that they were able to do that. But a lot of times that's why this is so difficult to try to pull off. So You know, it's interesting. One of the most common requests we've had this fall is drone trials for our fungicide application, which surprised me. But that is one of the most common requests we've had for a new study is, is utilizing drones because there are more and more companies out there who are beginning to get pods of drones where one goes out and flies, the other one's reusing up. And then another one goes out and flies, and they have these basically groups of drones, so they're always going. So I, I actually didn't think that would be a thing. But uh, anyhow, all right, we got this question. What should I add to my fungicide pass on corn and soybeans? Steve, you talk a little bit about that in your conversation. What, what's your opinion? Yeah, so I think PFR has really shown us there's some opportunities to add to this fungicide pass. And so I'll kind of take it from a um, – foliar feed standpoint or nutrition standpoint. From, a, from corn, we think about a boron uptake, right? It's real steep in the beginning, levels off. When we go into grain fill, it takes off again. So boron is essential to grain fill and, and adding weight, adding size to those kernels. So both on corn and soybeans, there's, there's, there's three products on corn, one on soybeans that are PFR proven, boron added in at that fungicide pass. Now, on, on, another thing on soybeans, I think it's really catching my interest it is also is the boron plus molybdenum or molly like a smart BMO product seen very consistent out of adding that in with fungicide that molybdenum helps move the boron through the plant also helps with some nitrogen fixation in soybeans so boron plus molybdenum with that fungicide pass on soybeans are, are a couple of the things I'd really target boron on corn boron molybdenum on soybeans You're getting a lot better at saying molybdenum I am I'm getting a lot of practice anything the only other thing I'd add to a fungicide pass is check your water. Uh, fungicides are a lot more effective. They have a lot longer half-life if we can get them slightly acidic in that 5 to 5.5 five pH. So when you're spraying a fungicide, check your water. Maybe use a water conditioning agent to, to bring that pH down in the water and make your fungicides more effective. And the other thing, too, is give that – I see this a lot of times. We condition our water. We here's the conditioner, here's the product, here's the mix, go, run out, right? Give that conditioner a little bit of time to work its magic in that, in that, in that water, right, before you start dumping other things in there. So I think sometimes we, I think sometimes guys do conditioner water and then we start throwing other things in a little bit too quick. We got to give it just a little bit of time to, to get stirred around in there and, and do its thing. So, so give a little bit of patience when you're doing that as well. I think that'll go a long way. Questions out, in, out here. Any questions for anybody? This one came in. Let's, uh, Jason, I'm going to ask you this first, and then I'll go to Steve. But, Jason, talk a little bit about uh, are there any PFR-proven sugar products? Mm -hmm. And then Steve actually talks about this in his agronomy tent talk. Um, are there certain stages where you've seen the plant benefits from sugar the most? So, Jason, talk a little bit about what we've tested, what's PFR-proven, and then yep. Steve... Go from there. Yeah, so we've done a lot of sugar testing. We've done it on corn, on beans. We've done it in furrow. We've done it foliar. And then the products, uh, three or four products, Centos, Exceeded, Nano Brown Sugar, uh, just a feed grade dextrose product. Uh, there might be one more I'm missing, but uh, at there least those three. Nanozyme. Uh, Nanozyme. Nanozyme's yep. got some sugar to it as well. So um, so we've got some good product. They're, it, they're cheap. Uh, good bang for your buck. And you know, I think Steve's got good information on kind of that the timing and where, where you know where you like to use those sugars. Yeah, so it's panned out. You know, a lot of guys ask about in furrow applications. Um, you know, it seems like the later the planting season goes, the warmer soil gets. We get more benefit out of the sugar in furrow. But from a PFR proven standpoint, really where the sugars have played out in soybeans has been that R1 time frame. So. Plants produce sugars, right? I just had a Mountain Dew before I came in here, right? It's the afternoon, I'm getting tired, I need a boost. 
So sugar's all for that right as we go into grain fill, right as we're starting really, I guess not really grain fill, but pod set, grain set. Same way on corn, V4 on corn, we're just starting to set that ear and those kernels around, giving it that load of sugar right before we go into that has been PFR proven as a timing for sugars as a full ear feed. Jason, why are sugar products profitable? What's one of the big reasons they're profitable? They're cheap. They're cheap. And they stimulate <clears throat> that microbial activity, and it doesn't take much to, to gain a lot. Yeah. yeah. They're pretty inexpensive. What else? Anything else from the group? They're making it easy on us. I know. Anything else? All right, I got one more here. I'll throw it up, and then we will probably wrap it up. John Skinner, how late is too late to apply nitrogen in corn? <laughs> Not anymore, we have to differentiate that, but in corn. Uh, <clears throat> so in my opinion, I do not like making nitrogen applications post-tassel as long as we have an adequate supply of nitrogen already on. There's been times where late in the game, uh, because of flooding or or missed nitrogen applications, we have top dressed with urea late with the airplane. But post tassel, I really don't like it. I really want to be set up uh, to have enough nitrogen in the soil profile before that. So anytime before VT would be my opinion to have about 25% of my total needs left available to the plant. Yeah, I would almost say for me, I it's, I'm going to be more in that V7, V8 time frame in the east, right, as we, as we fight some of our different soils and what John's got. We just don't mineralize as much nitrogen out. So we need more of it up front. we got to get it in that plant. And ultimately, like you said, if we got a really <laughs> saturated situation, some weather that dictated it, we could go out there with wide drops. And, and then at that point, where if I'm coming in with a little bit of rescue as an addition because my initial shot's gone, then I'm in the same stage he is, right? We're right at that pre-tassel time frame. But my plan is really before probably V7 for me. Yep. Jason, does that mean the late application? And John touched on this, but you could never see a response from a R1 nitrogen application? No, but but time and time again, when we first started messing with wide <clears throat> drops years ago, we, we, were, we were always disappointed, it seemed like, when we were trying to do – it wasn't a rescue application. We were a planned approach, and what we were doing is we were – we were saving back too much for too late. We weren't putting enough on up front, like Steve said, especially here in the east. Uh, I like to have it all on, same with Steve, V6, V7. And I like I like the good placement of 2x2x2 two by two by two followed by pushing that side dress out to V5, V6, maybe even if you, if you can, if you're putting it on, uh, on enough with the planter. Um, but where, where the late season comes in and where it can be profitable is a rescue app. So where we've lost a lot of nitrogen, you've got an opportunity to go out there maybe right ahead of a nice rain and and why drop that and that rain incorporate that down and that plant catches it like a funnel and puts it right where you want it. So I think those are the times when we can run late and be a gain. I think it's it's I think those times are the the rescue times and not the planned times. I'll, I'll clarify. I would prefer that it was on by B7 <laughs> okay. or B8. <laughs> yeah. But when is too late? Yeah, the question the was how late is too late. Yeah. So, so let last I would question. Prefer it earlier. And we got this this morning and and it popped up here is uh, sulfur with my nitrogen. How much? When should I? Why? Yes. Let's talk a little bit about sulfur. You say yes, Jason. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, who wants? You want? I'll start with Steve. Steve go to Steve you. Steve did it last yep. time. Perfect. Yep. I mean, in three words. <laughs> three words. Yeah. Every time you apply nitrogen, have sulfur with it. I mean, that's that's ultimately what we found. Um, it, it acts as stabilizes that nitrogen. Helps nitrogen get in that plant. That's for corn and wheat. Uh, ultimately, every time you go out there with nitrogen, have sulfur with it. Uh, there is some difference, I think, in hybrids as we start to learn more about our hybrids and things like that. But ultimately, every time, yeah, just put it in. What rate? What rate, Jason? We've tested a number of things. Uh, I think I think the rate for me goes back to what we were just talking about on hybrid. You know, I think I think for me, I want to learn a little more about how the, how the genetics respond, so I can dial in that rate. Wait. That's really what we're doing in PFR with these studies. We're looking at two different. Uh, two different types of hybrids and, and seeing how they respond to that sulfur at those different ratios. So I want to see a little bit more of that uh, so I can dial it in by hybrid. So you're saying hybrid. Dang it. We're just figuring out nitrogen. You're, now you're saying hybrids respond different to sulfur too? Yeah. Big Our data. Time. I think it's page 110 of the book. It, it, it's pretty interesting <laughs> data <laughs> that says there are differences even in hybrid genetic bases. Yeah. So, so. It's, risk, it's risky to say here's the ratio that's going to work. 
because that's that is going. I feel, now I'm an agronomist. I feel like it's yeah, going it to depends. depend. It depends. <laughs> it will depend. All right. I said one more question. We'll do it. First of all, any any more questions? Because I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about nitrogen or sulfur and soybeans as well. Any any other questions here? Out here. Last question then is what about sulfur and soybeans and uh, Mr. Castile at Purdue and what he's done? Yeah. So that's been a little more inconsistent. Now Purdue's shown some really good data on on taking sulfur, just a dry AMS or even a liquid ATS in your spray early on in the season, right? Soils aren't mineralizing sulfur yet. Soybeans seem to react to that. It's actually really interesting. You look at our PFR data, we get a better sulfur response the farther north we go. So soil tests at Minnesota are the highest we have in PFR for sulfur, and they have the biggest response to sulfur on soybeans. And it has to do with mineralization when that's available. So I like an early shot of sulfur, probably around that 20 pounds. But I'll be honest, as I go south, it gets more inconsistent. Mm -hmm. But I do think over time that through PFR, we'll start to learn when, why, and how. But if you're looking at sulfur right now on soybeans, it's probably just a dry AMS, about 20 pounds worth of actual sulfur right at planting. Yeah, the, the Purdue data, a lot of that's on those coarse textured sands. Yeah, yep, and, yep. and so it makes sense that we're seeing those responses. John, anything? No, I agree with Steve. I mean, it's, yep. it's good info. Okay, time for one last question. If there's anything out there, <laughs> if not, I know I have said that three one times. More, more, I know. More. Anything else? Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of the show. Safe travels home. Let us know how we can help. So have a great day, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're having a great day here at Technology Days. My name is John Skinner. I'm a regional agronomy manager here at Bex, covering the central region, uh, which is Illinois, Missouri, and that's about it. So I have a very small region with a lot of acres of crop. Um, today we're going to be speaking about the yield components of corn and things we can do to influence corn yield throughout different growing stages of the year. Okay, so we'll jump right into it. And I'm, I made a diagram here. Uh, it's a triangle, real innovative, real bright, colorful, but it's the three phases of grain yield, yield in my opinion, and we have to maximize each one of these in order to maximize our full yield potential on our farms. So we'll go through three stages here. It'll go just like you go throughout the growing season to keep it easy to follow. And I'll give you a few recommendations on how we influence some of this stuff. So the first one that I always like to talk about when we're talking about grain yield is the start of the season. And that's going to be ears per acre. So we'll dive more deeper into these as we go, but you can see two different planting populations there. Obviously, we're going to have a vast difference in ears per acre. The second one I talk about is kernel number. Now, there's two factors that go into kernel number at two very different times throughout the growing season that we'll dive into. And the third one, and probably the most influential one and the most that we can do, uh, do the most about, is kernel weight. And all kernel weight stuff is going to come post-pollination as we move through the grain fill process and then the black layer. So three, three key components at four very distinct time frames throughout the year is going to give us our, our grain yield triangle. And if we miss any one of these, any one of these areas, we're going to see a reduction in yield and we're not going to maximize our full potential out there. So we'll dive right into it. And as I said, this is going to go throughout the growing season. So when we look at plants per acre, there's really only a very brief time, years per acre, that we can set up for that. And that's at planting all the way to about V3. That's when we really focus on ears per acre. Now, we'll dive more into that later. Next there you see ears per plant. Now, if you look up research and data on how to influence yield from years gone back, they'll talk about ears per plant and maximizing the number of ears per plant. Since it's 2022, I really don't care how many ears per plant we have as long as we have one. That's what I want to do. I want to maximize one single ear on every single stalk of corn to give us the highest end yield. Our genetics are tailored that way. Our nutrient management plans are tailored for that. So multiple ears per plant is not something at this time that interests me. Kernel rows. That's one, of the, that's one of the number of kernel perspective, and that's around. That's the girth of the plant. That's usually going to start off here at that V5 
growth stage, and it's going to carry through to about V6, V7, depending on your genetics. So during that very crucial time frame, that corn plant is determining the number of kernel rows around that it's going to put on. The next step is kernel length. Okay, so when that ear initiates, we get, we get the initiation of girth and then the initiation of potential harvestable kernels. We'll talk about that more later because that's a, we actually only retain about half the number of kernels that we set on a plant for the harvestable one, but those will be kernels down the row. That time frame is going from about V7 all the way up into R3. We're talking about kernel number all the way up to R3 because R3 we can still abort some kernels. Now kernel weight, it's got it on the graph as R4 to R6, but realistically we're going to be talking R2 to R6 in this conversation. So we'll stair step throughout the growing season. If you got questions or want to stop me at any time, just raise your hand. There's a massive air conditioner behind me so I can't hear. And if you got a question, I'll just walk out to you so I can hear it, okay? All right, we'll dive right in. Ears per acre, pre-plant to V3. I say pre-plant because there's some stuff about soil conditions in here, okay? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say that seeding rate is the number one way to influence your ears per acre. There's no way around it. If you set your population at 20,000, you're going to have 18 to 20,000 ears per acre in most situations. You set it at 35,000, same thing. You're influencing your ears per acre by your seeding rate. Now, not all geographies in the world can support more ears per acre, and so you have to take that into consideration too. I'm not saying go out there and raise your plant population if your soils and your fertility can't handle it, okay? This is just a good graphic. Which side of the picture do you think is going to have more ears per acre? The 16,000 sporadic on the left or the 34,000 perfect picket fence stance on the right? It's probably the right. That's, yeah, pretty simple. This is actually a picture from one of our thin stand management trials where we purposely plant a lower stand with sporadic spacing to see what management practices we can do to influence yield in those situations to avoid a replant situation, okay? So that's actually where that comes from. And there's some really good data, uh, I think on two or two and two or three if you wanna dive more into that, okay? But there are a lot of management practices and a lot of things that we've found at Practical Farm Research that are going to influence our ears per acre and early season growth and vigor. And we'll dive into those now. And what I want to do is I want to start with the basics, okay? We talk all the time about making that planter pass and making it perfect. And one of the greatest ways to influence plant stand as well as uniform emergence is going to be your planting depth. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to get too far in the weeds here between one and a half inches and, and two inches. Both of those are adequate. Most of the time, I'm going to recommend a two-inch planting depth. But look on either side of that. If you get to two and a half inch planting depth or three inch, you're starting to lose yield right off the bat. And these are at our PFR farms, and they're pretty good, pretty forgiving soils in most cases, except southern Illinois. That's moon dirt, and it's, it's funny stuff. But we start losing yield. When we get over into the one inch planting depth, we really see a drop off in yield, 11 bushel in that situation. Okay, so regardless of your moisture content of the soil, regardless of your field conditions, we want to set that planting depth because in these situations, a shallower planting depth is going to lead to more uneven emergence. You're going to have a greater influence because of dry weather and heat, and you can start to see some plants pull back early in the season in those situations. The other thing it does is if you plant at an inch, your nodal roots are going to, are going to form probably a quarter inch below the soil surface. And when that happens and you have a huge influence on uh, temperature and moisture, they're not going to grow. They're not going to grow efficiently. And the only way we can rectify that is pray that we get about a half inch of rain a week for about a month. Okay? Then we'll have good gr root growth. So really simple. Planting depth is going to lead to harvestable ears per acre. The thing at the bottom here is really interesting to look at. We got dark soils on this side and we got clay-based soils on this side. Okay? And what each bar represents is a different planting condition. So from left to right, in each respective soil, we planted wet, we planted marginal, and we planted when the soil conditions were good. Okay? So I know, being an agronomist and covering a large area, for the last 15 years that we never plant wet or marginal. So we don't really have to pay attention to those. We always plant in good conditions. I'm just kidding. 
But look, look what happens. Each one of these different colors represents a different date of emergence for this population. So when we planted wet, we have one, two, three, four, five, six different days of emergence in that population. And the size of them represents the number of plants that came up at that respective growth stage. When we get into good conditions, you have three emergence dates and a huge percentage of them came up within the first day or the second day. That leads to uniform stand as well as more plants per acre, okay? So let's avoid those wet and marginal conditions. You know, the unique thing about this was these, these would be considered normal planting dates for most of our geography. April, April, mid-April planting date, the emergence was April 21st to April 27th, okay? In the wet conditions versus the fit conditions, we lost 11 bushel per acre of yield. That's in the April planting frame. If we take this data and move it out to the second half of May or the first week of June planting date, and we plant in wet conditions when it's hot, and then we wait till it's fit and plant in those conditions, our wet conditions lost 86 bushel to the acre. Okay? So as we get later in the season, making sure our conditions are fit to plant and our ground is in good shape is even more important than early. So if you want to plant wet, plant wet early. Okay? The next thing, closing wheels. It wouldn't be a Bex Practical Farm Research meeting if we didn't talk something about closing wheels. And I think, I think I'm the only one doing it this week here at Vecnology Days. So here's our plug for our most popular studies ever of closing wheels. You can see the open seed slot there. That was caused by not getting enough closing pressure on those closing wheels. We lost stand because of that. If you have an open seed trench, you're open to insects, you're open to varmints, you're open to drying of the furrow, all kinds of different things that are going to reduce plant stands. And you can see from the data up there, any closing wheel we used that wasn't a solid rubber, that had some sort of tines or some sort of notches on them, grooved, they gave us a yield advantage, 2.7 to 5.1 bushel per acre. This is one thing that's very easy to do. It doesn't cost a whole lot to do. And you see an increase in plant stand, OK? So on these studies, we average about 1,200 more plants per acre in the cornfield versus a solid rubber. I will throw one caveat on there. If you're farming real thin sands, real light sands, stay with the solid rubber closing wheels or go to a cast closing wheel. They're the best thing you can do in those situations because you want to get rid of that air pocket in the trench, and that's the only thing that's going to do it is that weight pushing down on them. Any other conditions, if it's no-till, if it's dark soils, clay, Conventional till, more board plowed, up and down the hills, it doesn't matter. These, these notch closing wheels or these spikes, serrated closing wheels, do a lot better job across soil conditions. And we see it from a yield standpoint and a plants per acre standpoint. Final thing I want to touch on is a little bit on nitrogen. We've seen time and time again at our Bex Practical Farm Research site that applying nitrogen with the planter, 30 or 60 units, gives us a, a pretty substantial yield advantage over 100% pre-plant incorporated, or even up front and coming back with a side dress from another form that's not on the planter. So 215 bushels, uh, we, we raised on average over four years using 30 units, two by two. When we take that rate and we double it, and we split it between both sides of the row, so two by two by two, we picked up another seven bushel to the acre. So that's a recommendation I've been making a lot lately, is if you have planter applied nitrogen, to look at putting it on both sides of the row and logistically, if it's feasible for your operation, up that rate a little bit because we're seeing quite a substantial gain by just upping the rate and putting that up front. That is one of our PFR proven success strategies. So our success strategies are those things that consistently pay us back the most at our PFR sites and that's, that's one of them. That's success strategy number three. Success strategy number four is side dress nitrogen, and specifically earlier in the season. And we'll dive a little bit more into that later, but you can see these, or excuse me, these ROI advantages that you see listed here is versus 100% pre-plant incorporated. So like a weed and feed application and then, then working it into the ground. So just by putting on some with the planter and then side dressing the rest, or side dressing 100% of it early in the season at V3, we're giving ourselves $72 an acre advantage. That $72 an acre advantage is based on $4.76 corn. So you can think of your economics that you have going right now. Potentially, your ROI could be substantially higher 
than the numbers we have listed there. Okay? All we're doing here is, is having a goal to protect the plant early, give it all the nutrients it needs when it comes off those seed reserves, and get it off to a good start. Simple as that to affect our ears per acre. Component number two is kernel number. All right? That's the size of our ear. That's a number of kernels on our ear. And there's two very distinct time frames that I discussed earlier that this is going to happen. V5 to V8 is going to be our kernel rows around. And then V8 to V15 or V17 is going to be our kernel length. Okay? So we're going to touch on both of these a little bit. When I say kernels per row, that's going to be the length. When I say kernel rows, that's going to be the girth. Okay? I just don't want to confuse anybody. I'll confuse myself here in a minute and mess it up. But just so you guys know, kernels per row, kernel rows. Okay? 99% of kernels per row, or excuse me, cur see, I told you I'd do it. 99% of kernel rows are going to be determined by genetics, okay? If you got a product that puts a 14, 16 around on, more than likely, if you got adequate growing conditions and aren't in a huge amount of stress, it's going to put 14 to 16 on. I don't care if you put down all the nutrients in the world, feed it everything, run it under irrigation and water it all the time. The genetics are going to be what's going to drive that kernels around. Now, for kernel numbers around, there's a lot of things <clears throat> that we can do to negatively impact that. So we're trying to talk here about increasing yield and, and things we can do to influence higher yield and more kernels and more kernels around. I want to give you an example of something you shouldn't do. And it has to do with herbicide applications. And I see, I see this all the time in cornfields, okay? A corn plant is a basally developed plant. The ear is, basally developed, meaning it, it, it always starts everything it does from the base. So when it initiates those ovules, it does it from the butt all the way up. When it starts to pollinate, the bottom of your ear pollinates first. So what I see here is we have normal kernel rows here. Kernel rows around at the bottom. I said this, this starts at about V5. So at V5, up until probably V6 or so, we had normal ear development on this corn plant. Then something happened right here. And it shrunk it up. It caused those kernel rows to be aborted and gone. When I see this, 100% of the time, it's a herbicide application. In this specific example, it was an ALS chemistry, a group two, that was sprayed late V6, early V7. It was an off-label application, and it caused that massive shrinking of the ear there. We lost about four kernel rows around in this field, and it cost about 75 bushel an acre, just from a misapplication of, of stuff like this. Later on in the season, there were some ears in this field that were tipped back all the way from the end. They just didn't have ovule development from that. Um, it was a bad situation. So one thing we shouldn't do is, is misapplications of herbicides because this is a very, very sensitive time frame in that corn plant's life, and you can drastically affect yield uh, by off-label applications. So check your labels. More importantly, check the corn plant. I mean, this year where I live, we had a slow start to the growing season, and we had V6 corn that was only this tall. The nodes were stacked, the leaves were there, but you're like, hey, we can spray that with whatever we want. But really, from a physiological standpoint, it was V6. It was already there. It just hadn't had any internode elongation because we hadn't had any heat. All right. We're going to talk about kernel length, or excuse me, length of the ear now, kernel number length. This is an ear set, an ear initiation. If you split a corn plant open about V7, V8, pull the sheath back on all of it, you'll find one of these little fellas at every node out there. Okay? That is full of ovules. Corn, corn ovules, they haven't been pollinated yet, obviously, since we're still in the vegetative stage. Anybody want to guess how many ovules are on there? How many kernels at that point on that picture could be produced from that little baby ear? Anybody? I can't hear, so I don't know why I'm asking. Okay. Realistically, there's about a thousand ovules on that plant. Okay? There's about a thousand to twelve hundred ovules on that plant. 
And this continues to develop all the way up into one week before pollination. Okay? And in this situation, when I say develop, I mean pull back ovules. Once it sets that ear and they continue to develop, as we get within one week of pollination, we start to lose some ovules in most situations. Okay? So 1,200 on there. A typical corn ear that we produce now has somewhere between four and 700 kernels on it. So the, the corn plant sets a position or sets, sets an ear that theoretically has the potential to double the yield we're making now, and we can't keep them all, okay? Because of environmental stresses, because of nutrient stresses, because of whatever else out there, you can't maximize the potential of this, okay? So there is potential to keep two, two to three times more of the kernels that the corn plant sets out there, okay, to influence that length. Environmental stresses, like I said, are the leading cause of ear length reduction. So, how can we influence our corn plant to keep those kernels? Okay? There's two ways. Two key nutrients that I like to focus on to keep our kernel length in that later vegetative stage. The first one is the one everybody always favorite talks about, and that's nitrogen. The reason I want to focus on, on nitrogen, because you can see here, as a corn plant gets to V6, V7, you see a rapid uptake of nitrogen. The graph goes up and to the right. That corn plant's taking between seven, nine pounds of nitrogen in per day, okay? So per acre, we're taking seven to nine pounds of nitrogen in per day. So we need to have adequate fertility there at that time, or we're gonna see a reduction in ear length. We will see it start to pull some of those ovules off. We'll see it start to have some, some stress uh, because of the lack of nitrogen. So that's why a lot of our studies at PFR have that V3 nitrogen timing. That allows us to get it put on. You know, with UAN, we have a good portion of it available right up front, and it allows the rest of it to convert to an available form when the plant needs it and can use it. The other one is potassium uptake. It's got a very, very similar time frame and model of when it takes up, when the corn plant takes up potassium. So this year, a lot of times, I got the question right before here. A gentleman asked me, he said, I got corn that goes like this and dips down on some lighter soils and then gets taller again, dips down on some lighter soils all the way across a, a, a certain field that he had. And I said, that's probably potassium deficiency because he was dry, okay? If, if it is very, very dry, the corn plant has a hard time taking in potassium. And what that leads to is shorter internodes. You don't get as much tassel exertion. Uh, you have more stress on the plant because potassium is, is critical in water management inside the plant. It's responsible for node elongation, stress mitigation, disease mitigation, things like that. And so you start to see some of that waviness in your cornfield over time if you're short on potassium. One thing I've really liked doing here over the past couple years for in-season potassium is side dressing or wide dropping a product called uh, potassium thiosulfate, KTS, if you will, okay? It does two things. It gives us in-season potassium, which the plant needs, especially in drought conditions when it can't get it from the soil, as well as it gives us our sulfur that we need. And we'll touch more on sulfur on the next slide. But that is a product in commercial fields that we've been running for a couple years and seen some pretty good response, both visually and from a yield aspect. It's not really all that expensive to run. You need a gallon or two of it in most situations. So it might be something to look at uh, if you want to influence, maintain some of this kernel, or excuse me, ear length. Here's sulfur again. Now, I like to talk about sulfur because over the past 10 years, we've had a drastic change in the, in the sulfur needs of our crops, right? 10, 10, 12 years ago, we were getting sulfur from the atmosphere. Then we had a little thing called the Clean Air Act, and it took a lot of the sulfur out of the diesel fuel and a lot of the manufacturing stuff. So we don't get it naturally anymore. And this is probably, some will say the fourth most important nutrient in corn. Some might say the third. Um, but we really need it. It's a huge component of nitrogen metabolization. So if you're short on sulfur, 
your corn plant can't produce the enzymes necessary to take in the nitrogen and put it in a form that's translocated throughout the corn plant. That's a really simple way of, of saying that, but it can't do it, okay? It's also an important structure of chlorophyll, so that's the green in our leaves, right? We want those leaves as green as possible because the, the, the job of our corn plant is to capture sunlight, to keep it all from touching the ground, turn it into sugars, shove it into the ear, make us yield, make us money. So if we don't have that, if we don't have sulfur, we break down that whole situation, okay? Similar uptake curve, but it's a little later in the season. We get to about V12, we start ramping up. When we look at sulfur needs of corn, we need about 0.1 pounds of sulfur per bushel we want to produce. That's a pretty, pretty general recommendation there. So 200 bushel corn, you're looking at about 20 pounds of sulfur you need to apply. Our soils give us some naturally with the breakdown of organic matter and mineralization. You can count on about three to five pounds of sulfur per percent organic matter in your soils. Okay? The rest you have to make up using a sulfur product. So how do we apply sulfur? Well, there's, there's a million different ways, and it's all going to depend on what kind of equipment you have, what kind of time you have, and what kind of soils you have. Okay? So just remember, sulfur is very, very mobile in the soil once it converts into the sulfate form. It's just like our nitrogen. It can be leached, it can move all around, and it's, it's generally not going to go from season to season. So two-year spreads of sulfur or two-year applications of sulfur like you might do on your DAP and potash is probably not something we want to entertain. Okay, so there's elemental sulfur that I strictly use mostly in the fall because it goes through a conversion process before it's available. So you can spread that with your dry fertilizer in the fall if that's easiest for you. Uh, you can put it on with your weed and feed. You can run ammonium thiosulfate um, with your burn down or pre-plant herbicide pass. You can put it two by two with your planter. You can use ammonium thiosulfate in that situation. If you're in an area that tends to top dress with either urea or AMS, that's a very viable option. It can also be side dressed as well as wide drop. So there are a million different ways to put on sulfur. One thing I do recommend, though, is that we stay with, with uh, <clears throat> a product like ATS or AMS or elemental sulfur that is a high percentage of sulfur, and we don't try and get our sulfur needs just out of a foliar feeding application. Uh, like some of the pre-mix foliar feeds that Steve talks about in his talk. We need too much. We're talking about pounds per acre, 20 pounds per acre. We need too much to get it from a foliar application. Okay? This is one thing I see in almost every field, especially early on. Uh, if, it's, if it's wet early in the season and cool, we'll see a sulfur deficiency because either we haven't applied it or we haven't mineralized any from the soil yet. All right, stage three of yield components of corn, we're going to talk about kernel weight. And like I said earlier, there's more in this section that we can adjust and more things that we can do in this section to influence yield than any of the other sections. And I want to talk about it because there's lots of stages that are vastly different in the reproductive cycle. So when we think about corn that goes from V8 to V9, vegetative, there's not a whole lot that goes on there. We add another leaf, right? There's not a whole lot of development stuff going on. Maybe we start initiations and break root. But when we go from R3 to R4, there's a whole lot going on there in the reproductive stages. So that's why I want to talk about this. Here's a kernel cross-section at R3. R3 is commonly referred to as the milk stage in corn. Okay? You can see exactly why right here. See, there's, no, there's not a whole lot of hard endosperm built up. There's not a whole lot of starch and everything accumulated in that. It's a white, milky substance. You see the start of the embryo there. These kernels right here, when they're in this stage, because of their makeup and their consistency, are still prone to abortion or loss. Okay? Because that plant can pull back. It can say, I can't sustain these kernels anymore. We've, we've started the embryo. We've done some stuff. I know they're there. But if we get under a severe period of stress, it'll pull these back. And we see it every year. The kernels on the end of your ear, uh, that they're really yellow, really sunken about right now before maturity, those probably got to about R3 and then pulled back for whatever reason. Stress, lack of nutrients, anything. Now, when we move on and we get to R4, our kernels are pretty much safe. Unless we get hail, unless we get birds, unless the ear falls off the plant, 
our kernels are safe at R4 for the most part. So you can see the buildup of some starches and sugars there. Hard endosperm, it's getting ready to, to make grain. R5, very important growth stage here. And I want to be able to keep our plant alive and happy and healthy all the way up to R6. But this is a very crucial growth stage because a lot of times we stop right here and we go, corn's done, it's over, can't do anything else about it. But at R5, at the dent stage, we've only accumulated 50% of the total kernel weight that we're going to accumulate. Okay? And we're looking at 15 to 20 days until black layer at this point, and we're only 50% of the weight. So it's very, very critical that our plant's still taking up nutrients. We're still taking up a little bit of nitrogen at this time point. We're remobilizing things throughout the, throughout the plant. That's why we need our sulfur, our potassium, and our phosphorus ready to go at that point. And then R6, everybody knows, is black layer. Once we get to here, our kernels are made. As long as we can get them in the combine, we got it made at this point. You're not going to see any reduction in kernel weight there. <clears throat> so when we talk about stresses at these different growth stages, they have a very drastic effect on the plant. So if we stress in that blister to melt growth stage, that R3, where we can still lose those kernels, you can see up to a 40% reduction of yield. And this is, this is after... Uh, four visible days of wilting on corn. So extreme drought stress, they noted up to 40% yield loss. This is from Michigan State University. Once we get to the dough, where I said those kernels are safe, we only see about 20 to 30% yield reduction. And that's all based on kernel weight. We don't reduce any more kernels there. It's all kernel weight. Once you get to, to R5, R6, if we have severe drought, you're talking 10 to 15% reduction you know, at the most, okay? So what are we going to do to influence that kernel weight? Phosphorus, a big one here. We don't think about phosphorus late season a whole lot, right? The majority of our phosphorus goes on in a dry fertilizer application for the most part. There are some out there that are using high phosphate starter fertilizers to get some of that phosphorus early in the season. But late season, we don't think about it. And realistically, it's a late season nutrient. Look at this uptake curve. When we get to R1, R2, so we're, we're pollinated at R2. We're done pollinating. We come up here, right to there, come over. We've only taken up about 60% of the total phosphorus we're going to take up in the year. So post-pollination, we're taking up about 40% of the phosphorus needs we have. Okay? So we have to have it there. We have to have it available. The other thing that's interesting about phosphorus is look where it ends up. The majority of phosphorus from a plant ends up in the grain. 80% of the phosphorus that a plant takes up ends up in the grain, which means it leaves your field, okay? Transversely on potassium, a lot of potassium is in the sink of the plant, meaning the stalk and in the leaves. You get rained on a couple of times, it flushes back through, returns to your soil. Phosphorus is different. It's leaving the field on you. So keep your phosphorus rates up. Pay attention to them on your soil test, especially your pH. You get into an acidic condition, phosphorus availability, availability dr drops drastically okay now I will tell you I don't have a great way to put on phosphorus in season there, there's not a good one they're expensive uh, you can get five to seven pounds of phosphorus through some liquid phosphorus pr programs you can apply in foliar you can side dress them like I said they're real cashy and expensive so if anybody out there has a good way to do it I'd like to hear it because the needs of phosphorus late in the season are critical to grain weight the other thing we can do is a fungicide. I love fungicides. I love applying them. We've seen a great return out of them. What you can see on our 2021 multi-location results is that every growth stage that we applied a fungicide in the reproductive stage, we were profitable with that fungicide pass. R4 got a little late across multi-location. We only had, saw about a dollar and 75 cent advantage to doing that. But basically what it does is it's going to in, in, enhance the photosynthetic efficiencies of the plant, right? You keep leaf diseases off that leaf, you're going to have more photosynthesis. You reduce ethylene in the plant. So ethylene's a ripening hormone. So anytime we can elongate that grain fill period, anytime we can keep that plant healthier later in the season through that R5 to pick up the rest of our kernel weight, we're going to see a yield enhancement. And a lot of times fungicide can do that. 
So the health of the factory, the leaves, the stalk, is directly correlated to yield. You can see here, pretty severe infection, a gray leaf spot. This was at one of our PFR sites last year in 2021. The corn on the right-hand side of your screen was not sprayed. The corn on the left-hand side was. Which one do you think has more photosynthetic activity? The left. Yeah, pretty simple. I don't ask hard questions up here. They're really simple. So you're going to have more starches, more sugar, longer grain fill period from this corn versus that one. Simple as that. One of my favorite things to do to promote kernel weight is apply a fungicide. Now, a lot of times we get asked, what's the best time to do it? Well, historically, it's been that VTR1. Up until about three years ago, I would have said that every time. Let me know when the field's tasseled. Go ahead and spray. I don't need to come look at it for disease, none of that stuff. Well, what we started noticing in about 2017 is our... Our disease profile in corn changed drastically. We started getting a little thing called tar spot, and we started seeing a higher incidence of southern rust moving farther north. So we started looking at fungicides a little different. There's the same graph I showed earlier. This was, for the most part, Kentucky, Central Illinois, Southern Illinois, Iowa, there wasn't a whole lot of disease in these plots, except one, and that was Southern Illinois. When we looked at Southern Illinois <coughs> data, R1, app, R, R, R1 application provided $120 per acre return on investment. Okay? You take that times $5, or divided by $5 corn, that's a yield response they saw in that plot. The thing that was interesting here, R4 still responded with $20 to the acre. On our, on our multi-location stuff, I'll show it again, it was only a dollar and 75 cent advantage. Southern Illinois, $20 advantage. $43 at R3, R2 was 50, 50 plus dollars. They had a lot of southern rust there. It came in later in the season. So they started seeing those applications be more profitable later in the season because we were protecting that grain weight on the tail end. Okay? So my fungicide recommendation has changed depending on where you're at. I live in northern Illinois. We got tar spot. It's terrible. I mean, we've seen 100 bushel yield reductions. This year at Tassel, there wasn't a disease lesion in the field to be found. You, you couldn't find one. So what we did is we decided we just push it back. We're healthy at VTR1. Our residual is going to run out before we get to R5. We know that. The last two years we've had tar spot and southern rust come in late. Why are we going to pull the trigger early in the season? So we pushed it off to about R3 some cases R4, and capitalizing on the tail end of that residual of the fungicide. I think we'll see it be beneficial this year because about, about 10 days ago, we started seeing the tar spot blow up from the, from the lower canopy up into the top. So we'll see what we do there. But my recommendation now, if you're dealing with tar spot, you're dealing with southern rust, I'd push it off a little later if you're clean. If you start seeing it at tassel, go ahead and spray it. But if you're clean, push it off and capture the tail end of that residual effect for your grain weight. All right, the final thing I'll touch on here, and the, the reason I like to talk about this one is because it lines up perfectly with the fungicide application timing, and that's boron. Okay? Boron has been referred to as a, the official pollination nutrient. I like to call it the nutrient of love because it has everything to do with pollination and tip retention. So longer pollen, vi pollen viability with boron. You have better tip retention on your corn ears, so those few last kernels you want to get on the end to add a little bit of yield, you'll get that with boron. Boron's kind of, the, kind of the general of the nutrient family too. He tells everybody else what to do. If you lack boron, there's nothing in those leaves that are shoving starches and sugars into the ear, organizing it. It's cell structure organization. Boron says, hey, all you guys, let's get together over here. We need to send some sugars to the ear. If you're short on that, you won't have as much photosynthetic activity and translocation. Pollination seed set, I already said that. So the, the thing with boron, too, is there's two very unique uptake curves here. So this is different than the nitrogen and potassium we looked at earlier. We wait till about V10 to start ramping up on boron. It ramps up. You get to about R1, and it plateaus. You get out to R2, R3, and it ramps up again. What are we doing? VTR1R2. That's right. 
we're, we're blowing a fungicide out there in a lot of cases. So we can, we can tank mix boron with our fungicide passes and get it at the timing that the plant's going to need it and it's getting ready to ramp up boron uptake. Now, the reason I also like it at this later uptake curve here is because boron doesn't move much in the plant. Once it hits the plant, it's utilized where it lands. It's not translocated. So when we think about photosynthesis and we start thinking about where there are nutrients to fill the ear come from, it's in the upper canopy, right? Those are the ones that are capturing the sunlight. So if we can get boron into that cell structure and get it to translocate and move those sugars and move those starches, that's where we're going to be most efficient with it at. The earlier season growth uptake, we're not going to use a whole lot of those leaves later in the season from, from here down on the plant for photosynthesis. So I like it later in the season. Here's some of our studies from our PFR site. There's a ton of different products on here. Brant Smart BMO, uh, HarvestMate Urea More, Correct, Brant Smart Potassium, and Boron. All of them have a pretty substantial yield advantage between one and a half and four bushel to the acre. You can see the ROIs up there. So we, just by adding a small amount, usually around a pint of these products to the acre that are fairly cheap to use, we're seeing upwards of $10 an acre return on some of these. Okay? You're already making a trip out there, so I'm not asking you to make a special trip. I'm asking you to look at some of these products. There's a lot of boron products out there. What I would recommend is a 10% boron blend product. So you can choose from whoever you want, if you, whoever your supplier is, wherever you get your stuff. Look at a 10% boron product, and I'd apply on corn a pint to the acre with your fungicide. Yep. We should see, I shouldn't say that. We should see minimal blending problems with it. They play very nicely together, the fungicides and the boron in the tank. <laughs> If you're adding anything else, I would definitely do a jar test, though. So really easy timing. It's going on with your fungicide. It's going to help promote kernel weight and kernel retention and drive those factors into yield. That is all I have for the yield components of corn. If you have questions, I will be up here uh, for quite some time. So feel free to come up and ask. I thank everyone for your time, for your attention, and hope you have a great rest of your day at Technology Days. But my name's Steve Gauck. I'm the regional agronomy manager for the East. So ultimately, this is uh, my 19th field show here with Bex. So I'll be here 20 years this fall. And I've, I've done the seed advisor role. I've done the agronomy role in southern Indiana. And now I cover all the agronomists in what we call our eastern region. So my family actually farms in southeast Indiana. I get the opportunity to, to raise the kids on the home farm uh, and farm with my dad and my sister and my brother-in-law. So. Um, I'm more just the general labor, it seems like, but that's what I enjoy and have a lot of fun there. But ultimately today, I want to talk to you a little bit about foliar feeding. And I'll be honest, right? If we go back seven, eight years ago and you would have came to me and said, Steve, I want to talk about foliar feeding, I would have said, well, I don't know. It, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I think they're snake oils, right? I don't, I don't know them. I don't trust them. Well, over time, though, we're starting to learn through PFR that we're seeing some consistency, we're seeing some trends, and we're learning that there is an advantage to doing some foliar feeding. So we're going to jump through some things here, but here's the first thing I want you to think about. Foliar feeding is not a replacement for commercial fertilizer, right? That's the first question I get. Well, can I cut out my dry fertilizer and foliar feed? Ah, there's a lot of risk involved with that, right? It's not a good substitute, but it's a good addition to your programs. Ultimately, soil fertilization is much more efficient and actually safer than a foliar application, okay? So that's something that, that you've got to kind of consider, right? I could be more efficient by putting fertilizer in the ground and really taking that fertilizer up through the roots. That's the most efficient way for plants to take up nutrients. But when we think about root growth, it functions best in cooler soils. So a lot of us have gone through a hot, dry summer. So what happens? Those roots aren't growing. There's not water in the soil to move those nutrients to those roots. So we start showing some deficiencies. Our roots lose their effectiveness when it gets hot and it gets dry. 
So actually, full air feeds and the absorption of that is more effective in the summer. So I kind of think about it, you know, think about the summertime here, being three quarters way through the season, it's kind of like my talk here later today, I'll have to have a Mountain Dew before it, right, to keep my energy up. So I think about foliar feeds, right, as an addition to helping that out. Now, ultimately, I want to ask you, what are your goals for foliar feeding? Why do you want to do it? Because that directs a little bit of where we're going with it. So one is maybe you just want to help with a nutrient deficiency. I, I've got a plant here. It's showing some type of deficiency. I'm going to foliar feed to offset that. Well, that's perfectly fine. You can do that. Well, I've been taking these tissue tests, and they tell me to do it. Well, but what do those tissue tests really mean? We think about soil tests, and they're a great gauge right, in terms of understanding the fertility levels in our fields and what we should do to maximize yield. But tissue testing is a little bit different. I think about the last 20 years of being in agronomy, when I took tissue samples, there was usually a problem, and I'd send them to the lab to get analyzed. But what are all the tissue tests that the labs have, right? Most of them were from issues. So when they say, well, here's the 20-year average of the level of sulfur in, in a leaf, they're basing off a lot of things that came in with a problem. So are those really accurate, or are they just a gauge, too? Also, you'll see some of the tours here today, they'll talk about the levels of like boron in a plant. And it should change, right? Is that plant should be building up and then moving those nutrients to the grain? So they should drop, right? Do we understand when they make those drops what those levels should be? But tissue testing still gives us a great gauge to understand, I need to watch this. Or what's the trend? This, this nutrient's been trending down so maybe I need to make a full air application. So they are valuable, but understand they're not the end all be all. Maybe your goal is to enhance yield. Okay, I want a full air feed to increase my yield. This is where PFRs really come into play, and especially PFR proven. Now we know we got this big PFR book, it's 390 some pages, right? It's a lot of information, it's hard to decipher. So a few years ago, we went to this PFR proven, right? So what's PFR proven is a little bit of review. Three years, a product or a practice has to increase yield. And over those three years, it has to have a positive return on investment. Because we all love farming, right? But we're not doing it just to break even, right? We want to make some money. So it's got to have a positive ROI. That makes it PFR proven. So what we're seeing now in a lot of things, especially in full air feeds, we're seeing some trends. We're seeing what products are PFR proven, but we're figuring out why, what, and when makes those things PFR proven. So we're going to plan on fuller feeding. So I'm going to take a step back tell you, you got to get the basics right. We got to be effective. We got to do the basic things right. No different than anything else we do in agriculture. So we're going to start off talking about water. We're talking about some spray volume, time of day, growth stage, and what nutrients are needed. And you go, water? Why, why? I'm here for a fuller feed talk. Why are we talking about water? The water is the largest component that touches that plant. So we've got to be really cognizant of what our water is and what it's doing. So hard water with a high pH will negatively affect the impact of foliar products. So I've had scenarios where it goes, well, I sprayed foliar feed at grandpa's and it worked. And I sprayed it at my house. It didn't. Well, where did you get your water? Well, I got water from grandpa's. I got water from my house. Okay, the water may have been different enough to impact the effectiveness of that foliar feed. So here you'll see we're doing some pH conditioning of water in our test. I want you to kind of keep in mind, especially the pink picture there, we're going to talk about that. So this is on soybeans, right? You see the soybean emblem up in the top left. Multi-location data, right? This is a water conditioning study. So we're trying to get the water right. We're taking Versamax AC, which is a PFR proven foliar feed and putting it in the water, not doing anything to the water. Takes the pH up to eight. Now we take this Brandt Indicate 5, we're dumping it in, and it's, it's kind of Bubba proof, right? That's why I like it, is you used to keep pouring it in there until that water turns pink. When that water turns pink, you're at a pH of 4.5 to 5.5. Five. You got your AMS, a lot of us use AMS, right? We think of AMS more as a conditioner, right? We're conditioning that hard water. Choice Trio, again, lowers pH. So you see the AMS, there's only a 7 pH, 
right? It doesn't lower it as much, but it conditions the water. Choice Trio brings it back down. So ultimately, what we got to do is get that water right, get that pH right to make that foliar feed work better. So you're going to see here, and I had a question from the first one, all these water conditioners then also had Versamax, right? That's how we compared it. So it's all had Versamax in, and even with the Versamax, that's where we were lower the pH. So PFR proven, right? Brand Indicate 5 on soybeans is PFR proven. So that three years of increased yield and positive return on investment. Almost $10 for taking the time to make sure your water is correct. That's easy money, okay? AMS worked, Choice Trio, not so much on the soybeans. But it really got me thinking, right? We talked about pulling water from grandpa's or from your place, how that affects stuff. So let's look at our PFR locations and see what happened. Brand Indicate 5 at our Kentucky farm, very successful. Choice Trio was good, but AMS actually lost us money. So getting the pH of water correct at our, our Kentucky farm was more important than conditioning it. Now we go to Central Illinois, look at AMS. Over $16 there. And the Choice Trio and the Brand Indicate 5 kind of tailed off. So there is more important to condition that water, understanding your water. Southern Illinois, Brand Indicate 5 was the only one that worked. So pH was critical there. Ohio, Brand Indicate 5, AMS worked. Choice Trio did not. Now this is in soybeans. So each location, each product worked differently. You've got to understand your water source and what does that water source need? Because all three of these products do some things slightly different. Now let's jump to corn. Again, we look at corn, Choice Trio, Indicate 5, AMS. Well, here the Choice Trio and Brand Indicate 5 were the most profitable. The AMS actually lost us a little bit. So we think about here that a corn leaf and a soybean leaf are not the same, right? What are their needs? How do they uptake nutrients? What's different? So Brand Indicate 5 and Choice Trio are both PFR proven. But Choice Trio didn't make it in soybeans. Okay? But Brain Indicate 5 did. AMS, actually, we see a loss. So again, I went to the individual sites. I said, what's going on? Again, Kentucky, pH was important. Brain Indicate 5 came to the top at $21 in corn just to condition your water when you add in your foliar feed. Right? It's getting that basics right. Here we go to Southern Illinois. Not quite as a big a change, but you actually lost money with the AMS. So when should I apply it? Or when should I add water conditioner? Well, you're going to see some new studies we're doing PFR actually talk about reverse osmosis. Okay, that may start to eliminate some of the need of these water conditioners. But ultimately, when you start pulling water from the sources you're pulling from, you're going to have to add them. You're going to have to get rid of that antagonism, get that pH right, make that product effective. So know what your water is and your water source, and then make adjustments based on that. All right, let's jump into foliar feed, time of day. We talk about this with fungicide all the time, right? Dew on the leaves, and how important that is, right? Dew on the leaves is worth about 160 gallons worth of carrier. That's a lot. So we know in fungicides it works. What about foliar feed? I think these were kind of some studies lost in the PFR book over the years, but we did these studies a few years ago. Soybeans, it's PFR proven to apply foliar feeds in the morning, right? We think about that, that plant through the evening, right? Stomatas are open, it's pulling in nutrients, it's relaxed, it's got dew on the leaves, it's pulling in those, pulling in all that stuff we're applying. So ultimately, eight o'clock, PFR proven to get up in the morning, 12 bucks an acre, just spray in the morning. So I condition my water, I spray in the morning, right? Those start compounding. Now, ultimately, the foliar feeds are still beneficial in the afternoon. We know that. But again, the profitability of moving fungicides and foliar feeds in the morning goes way up. Guess what happens in the afternoon? My herbicide control goes way up. So it's worth my time to change that stuff out and make those applications. Now, I know it's a pain, but in, a, in the commodities today, in terms of making money, right, these expensive inputs, how do we squeeze every dollar out of this? It doesn't cost you anything to get up in the morning and spray, does it? But you can make an extra $10 to $12 an acre on soybeans. What about corn? Three-year data, over $13 spraying in the morning. Now here we see an advantage. Corn starts to open back up in the evening. 
A little bit of an advantage to go back out there in the evening. Nice return on investment. That's the way it needs to work for you. But ultimately, we stay out of the heat of the day and be spraying herbicides then, there's a benefit. All right, carrier rate. So here you'll see this is from our fungicide studies, but it goes through the same concept with a fuller feed. Now, we know fungicides don't translocate through the plant very well. They translocate through the leaves very well. Nutrients, we know, translocate through the plant. But if I can get those nutrients across that whole plant, and that plant doesn't have to burn energy to move them, that's going to increase yield, right? I'm giving it more fuel from that standpoint, okay? And I'm getting it across that whole plant. So really, we look at that 15 gallons on corn, and we're going to look at 20 gallons on soybeans. We're going to see some pictures later to understand that, why getting that full air feed and that nutrients all the way down in that canopy is going to be a big difference. All right, sugar. We're going to get into some products now because that's what most of you came to hear. But sugar, right? We know plants produce sugar. We've seen a lot of advantages of sugar and PFR. Some of it's been inconsistent, but actually as a full air feed, it's been consistent. But here's the thing. We're looking at three different types of sugars. When should I use them? What should I use? What are they? So if we look here at sugar, feed grade dextrose, the brown sugar, centose, nanazine, what, what I want to start focusing on here, this is a trend showing up in PFR that's really caught my eye. So in corn, V4 on all these sugars is the timing that has become PFR proven. Sugar's a V4. What's going on in a corn plant at V4? Starting to set yield, aren't we? Starting to set kernels around. We're, we're, we're going into ear set. So what we're doing is giving that plant a load of sugars, a load of energy, right as it's going into ear set. Let's look at soybeans. They're all at R1. What's going on at R1? Flour. Yield set, right? That's when a soybean starts determining yield. Again, I'm loading it up with all these nutrients, full tank of gas, going into grain set. Now, what's the difference in these products? Feed grade dextrose is just corn sugar. Okay, pretty simple, right? The nano brown sugar is a humic acid. It's got molybdenum in it. We're going to talk more about molybdenum here through this whole talk because there's a trend coming with it. And it's got brown sugar. Your Cintos has your corn sugars, your brown sugars, has a fulvic acid. Also, we're going to talk more about fulvic acid and the role that it plays in pulling nutrients into the plant. The nanozyme here, we've got a humic acid, which really, fulvic acid comes from humic acid. Seaweed extract. So seaweed extract is an antioxidant. We're going to touch on that too. So antioxidants, we think about personal health and you've got to eat antioxidants, eat your blueberries and all that because they have antioxidants supposed to help with warding off diseases and things like that. Well, plants are no different. When you add an antioxidant into the mix, you reduce the stress load on that plant. They use molasses as their sugar. They've got some potash, but all different products, okay? But ultimately, we're adding, adding products to that plant. I don't have a pointer here, but the, the humic acid, the fulvic, all those help pull those nutrients into the plant even better. Feed grade dextrose gets a little bit of a free pass because it's so cheap, right? If you want to mess with getting that in a solution, it's cheap. All right, let's go into some of these products because, again, there's some trends showing up. So let's look at timing again, right? We're at V4 and R1. So right is that grain set. So Nutramax, AC, we got zinc, manganese, boron, calcium, and sulfur. This full-blown nutrient pack. So we're giving it Thanksgiving dinner, right? Right as it goes into grain fill. Now here, though, this Max in Ultra Manganese is just corn sorb, which is a type of fulvic acid, sulfur, and ma manganese. The Max in Ultra, right? Zinc, manganese, boron, and fulvic acid. Versamax AC, been the product we talked about earlier. It's a macro micronutrient pack with fulvic acid to help pull it into the plant. Here we're looking at manganese again, sulfur, fulvic acid, and then another macro micro fulvic acid that's more targeted to beans. Well, what's the trend here? Well, again, we kind of notice 
this micro pack of nutrients right at the start of grain fill. But here's what sticks out to me. These are the two most profitable foliar feeds in the PFR book. They're at V4 on soybeans. What's going on with V4 and soybeans? You're not setting any yield there. They're vegetative growth. What's happening? Well, most of you are probably making a post-herbicide application, right? Okay. What else is happening? That's really where nodulation is at full speed. It starts about V2, V3. What's the biggest stress on soybeans? Nodulation. Soybeans like a little stress, but they don't like a lot of stress. So at that time, so what is, why these three products? Well, those three are all antioxidant products, manganese, sulfur, and fulvic acid. They're relieving the stress on that soybean plant from nodulation, from the herbicide application, and gearing them up to keep moving. So to me, this is some unique things that PFR's pulling out. Micronutrient packs before grain set, fulvic acid, sulfur, manganese, during a heavy stress period of nodulation. So these foliar feeds work, we just need to know when and how to use them. Let's take a look at this group, okay? Some more stories come out of this group. First set here, you'll see macro and micronutrients, okay? They're all geared up going into the beginning of grain fill. So that's what we need, that full tank. Now, this micro blitz, again, micronutrients with some carbon right at grain fill. Here we're looking at a nitrogen, boron, manganese, sulfur, and zinc combination at V4 on corn, loading it up, right, as we go into the grain fill. The Brandt Smart BMO, it's just boron and moly. It's PFR proven. We're going to talk a little more about it. And then we go to this Quattro Plus. It's a full deal. Nitrogen, boron, moly, zinc, sulfur. But again, these two stick out. Why do they stick out? Because the timing is different. R3 on soybeans. What do they have in common that nothing else has had in common? They contain boron and they contain molybdenum. Well, what's that mean? Well, it's kind of interesting. I'll go into a little more detail later, but molybdenum does a couple things for the plant. One is it helps soybeans fix nitrogen. So at R3, what's happening? Right, our nitrogen, our nodules are starting to slow down because the stress of grain fills outweighing them. Molly helps offset that. Molly also acts like a grease gun for boron, helps it move through the plant better. Boron's important in, in grain set and grain size. It moves that product through. So now we're looking at this Molly boron combination at the fungicide time, at R3. So here you see more of a breakdown of these nutrients, right? The Versamax, the MN at the V4, right? It's focused on that manganese early on soybeans. And then we get this whole micronutrient pack, and you'll see what's consistent. Sulfur, zinc, manganese, boron. And a lot of them are starting to throw an iron, okay? So it's going to be one too. All right, fulvic acids. Let's take a look at this. Fulvic acid is an incredibly strong chelator. So what it does, it's a small molecule, it's a chelator, it's a plant, gets into the plant better, it's more usable to that plant. So we take this fulvic acid, we have our Smart Quattro Plus, we talked about, right, it's that loaded up one. We just added fulvic acid to it. What did we do? We doubled the yield. Now it's only 0.8 of a bushel, right, but we doubled the yield. Adding in that ability to get that nutrient in the plant better, and an antioxidant to help with stress at that R3 improved the performance of my foliar feed. Two-year data, right? Almost $12 return by adding fulvic acid. So we think about that. We're adding citric acid to our corn seed treatment, right? There's humic acid. There's some advantages to these antioxidants that we're seeing. Awful close, right? By fall, this one could possibly be PFAR proven, right? We'll see what the yields bring in. All right, other considerations, potassium acetate. So potassium acetate is more than five times likely to be absorbed versus other potassium forms when you spray. If you're gonna do a fuller feed, you need to be looking at potassium acetate. Much easier to absorb. 
adjuvant. So here I think about adjuvant and ultimately looking at things like fulvic acid, humic acid, other things to get those nutrients into that plant, to get them to stick to that plant, get them in there better. This is going to be some of the future technology we start seeing is out of these adjuvants. It's a pretty exciting stuff in our preliminary PFR data. So you say, well, Steve, that's all fine and dandy, but you know, I don't, I don't have a sprayer or I can't make all these passes you're talking about. I mean, you're talking about spraying foliar feeds three different times in my crop. Okay, it's difficult, but I am making a fungicide pass. Are there some things I should focus on in my fungicide pass from a foliar feed? And absolutely there are. So take a look at this, boron. These are soil test levels over 20 year period. Look at them dropping. Over 70% of the soils in the Midwest are deficient in boron. What happened? Well, you guys are all doing a better job raising higher yields and you're sucking the boron right out, right? It doesn't take much boron to raise a crop, but it's extremely important. But what's really happened is that trend line's exactly like sulfur. What happened to sulfur? Right, we pulled it out of the power plants. Right, pulled it out of the atmosphere, we cleaned it up. Well, guess what? Boron was attached to that. So we lost sulfur and we lost atmospheric boron. So that's why we're seeing this trend. Here's the uptake curve for boron. It's kind of interesting. We think about boron is really important for flowering, grain set, kernel set, but it's also really important for grain fill. So you see this big jump in an uptake. And ultimately, we've got a product now PFR proven with the planter and two by two by two. We're going to see more coming because of this boron, the trend line going down. But what's really happened is I think we're pulling boron out of the atmosphere and out of the soils during this time early on. We level off, takes off again during grain fill. Well, I don't have much atmospheric boron anymore. My roots, because it's hot in the summertime, aren't as efficient at picking up nutrients. So I'm missing boron during grain fill. So we've actually got three products in corn that are PFR proven to add to your fungicide that contain boron. So really look at kind of these 10% boron products, but adding boron at fungicide time has been extremely consistent on corn and increasing yield. And ultimately, it's increasing kernel size, kernel weight, kernel depth. We think about adding an eighth of an inch to the length of a kernel is worth about 20 bushels. Boron helps us do that. So this has been very consistent. We're also seeing PFR proven in soybeans at fungicide time to add boron. So one thing I'd consider is you're making a fungicide pass. Let's find a way to get some boron in it. Okay, here you'll see that the Smart BMO here on soybeans, which is a boron molly combination, is PFR proven in soybeans with your fungicide. So ultimately, we talked about the importance of that molly fixing nitrogen, helping that boron move through the plant. PFR proved it. The EZ Molly B was dang close. It's had some really good results up until this last year. Now here we're also looking at soybeans. So this is looking a little bit ahead. What do I think is going to be next? Well, here we see the Smart K, so potassium and boron. We know potassium is extremely important too to grain fill. Adding it in with my fungicide, seeing some nice returns. We got the Smart BMO up here. It's already PFR proven, right? Here's our Easy Molly B. This was the first year it kind of had, had fallen back on us. This Nature's K Flex. Again, we're looking at these potassium acetates. First years in the studies, but the results came back pretty quick that there may be also an advantage to potassium in season. So here's what I talked about earlier this picture of soybeans. We see here on the left, you see the yellow leaves on the bottom no boron, no molly, no potassium. Look at all the ones at the right. Look how green those plants are all the way down through there. Use my 20 gallons of water, get those nutrients down, keeping those leaves functioning in the bottom, increasing yield. Consistency there has been the boron with the molly and then the potassium. So ultimately, that's kind of what we're looking at now. Where do we move forward in, in PFR? Let's look at this potassium. Now, we've been talking a lot about boron. So, well, a little boron's good. What about more? Well, here we put on boron at R1, R3, and still saw a yield increase and increased profitability. We're running out of boron in our soils. We're not getting to them. So we talk about sulfur. Hey, every time you make nitrogen application on corn, I want you to put sulfur in. I don't know. Maybe we'll be almost to the point with boron. Every time you're going across that field, you got a little bit in there because it doesn't hang around the soil very long. 
All right, more fungicide additives. This is on soybeans in Kentucky. So we just talked about the Smart BMO and the potassium. And we had decent returns on it. But look what happens when I pull out Kentucky. What's different? Look at their bean yields. All over 100 bushel. Their rate of return is much higher on these products. Almost double the yield, right? You go from a bushel to two and a half. But adding these products, right? As those soybean plants start pushing higher yields, they need more nutrients and they're rewarding us for adding them. So in these high yield situations on soybeans, we're seeing a bigger benefit to foliar feeds, boron, potassium, and molybdenum. All right, what to be on the look for? All right, zinc's one of them I got my eye on. One, we see zinc in a lot of, a lot of these foliar feed products, if you noticed. Why is that? Same concept here, maybe. Soil tests are going down a little bit, but over 50% of the soils in the Midwest are deficient in zinc. So is that going to be the next player, right? We get the boron fixed, we get the potassium fixed, all that. Will zinc be our next concern? Maybe not, right? We're, a lot of our foliar feeds are filling that need right now. But here's the thing we think about. 71% of zinc is uptaken in a third of the growing season. So by making sure that plant has zinc going into that, right, we look at that grain fill, that's where we're seeing some response. So putting zinc on at the right time is going to be the most important. Back to molybdenum, okay? It's very interesting, the symbolic relationship between nitrogen fixation and rhizobia bacteria and molybdenum. So we talk about that R3, that stress on the bean. We're trying to fix all this nitrogen. We're going into grain fill. They're going to slow down nodulation. Molybdenum seems to help pull that through a little bit longer. Bring some more nitrogen in that plant. Sandy soils, low organic soils, they cannot retain moly, okay? So we're seeing a bigger benefit, I think, from, from that smart BMO and that situation. Boron and moly there. Also, we keep applying more and more sulfur because we know that that's, that's a nutrient we're concerned about. But the same mechanism takes up sulfur as it does moly. And as I have more and more sulfur out there and I got this little moly, I, what, what's winning, right? The sulfur is. So through the roots, we're struggling. That's where foliar feeds are coming into play. So again, consistent returns out of products that contain the boron and moly. Silicon. So I think about silicon, I kind of laugh. I think about plastic, right? But silicon really helps soybeans through plant or through stress. So we think about wet feet stress or drought stress. Silicon does help. And you'll see here some of the results. You know, every time I read the name pixie dust, I kind of chuckle, right? It's kind of a funny name. Came from California, so it all makes sense, right? But this Mainstay SI, right, another silicon product, we've seen some consistencies out of them. But here's what I think is interesting. I look at three-year data. 2019, 2020, 2021, some huge returns early, and then we dropped off in 01 with silicon. What happened in 2019 in the spring? Wet, 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 replant, 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 right? So again, anaerobic stress is what this helps with. 2020, some pockets were wet, some weren't. 2021, Early planting season around here for the most part, crops got off to a good start, didn't have the stresses, didn't see the reaction. So it doesn't become PFR proven, but it's really got me thinking, right, in terms of, hey, maybe when I get wet feet stress, is this something I can be utilizing to help that soybean plant through it? All right, something else I want to talk about, stress mitigation. So when you, this is looking at Flexstar, and so many of us aren't non-GMO beans, obviously, but we're looking at when we cause stress in soybeans, can we offset that? And this is a really great visual to do it because Flexstar burns leaves. So we add, we spray with Flexstar, then we, then we look at spraying Flexstar with combinations of brown sugar, Mitigate Plus, and other things. These are supposed to eliminate or lower the effect of the burn and the stress that Flexstar causes. Well, they've been doing that. We actually had a situation at home. We had to run some Cobra late on non-GMO beans, ran some Mitigate Plus with it, I was shocked, right? I was expecting to just burn these things to the ground. Yeah, they were, there were some out there, but you had to slow down the truck to see it. So I was impressed, right? And we look at two bushel increase 
from taking away that stress of the herbicide. So I challenged Jim and, and Jason this morning in my talk to, what about Liberty? What about Roundup? What about Dicamba 240? They got to metabolize it. Yeah, they're tolerant to it. That's taking some energy. Should we be looking at these products in that system too? And then obviously we got to look at weed control, right? Is it affecting weed control or not? Because we don't want to give that up. But this has been an interesting study and we've seen some easy visual results from it and the yields have followed. All right, so ultimately here as I wrap up, if you don't have the means to apply fuller feed or if you're even thinking about it, I want you to start with your soils though. This isn't like we talked about in the beginning, it's not a substitute, okay? It's an enhancement. So uh, we really got to start out with pH. Get your pHs right. When pHs are right, soils are more balanced. Then you use foliar feeds to enhance. If your pH isn't right, nutrient uptake is off, something's out of balance, then all the foliar feed's doing is putting a Band-Aid on it. Okay, then the next year you're going to have the same problem. You're just kind of bringing your yields up to what your potential could have been. If you really want to maximize your foliar feeds, balance your soils, get your pH right, then you'll enhance your yields through foliar feeding. I really appreciate you guys coming out. Keep on the lookout for these new PFR studies, right? This year's in the fall, there's going to be more foliar feeds coming. Pay attention to the timing and what's in them to be most profitable for you. Thank you very much and have a great show. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Becknology Days 2022. I'm Corey Beck, this is my dad Scott, and we are gonna go back and forth here for the next 35 minutes or so delivering the president's message. But to kick things off, I'd like to ask you a question. What do you believe in? Or maybe a better question is who do you believe in? Can you think of a time when you realized that you believed in someone or something? See, belief is fundamental to success. You can believe in God, you could believe in your family or your friends, a mission or a purpose, you can even believe in yourself, but belief is the only truly sustainable success strategy, and it's our core beliefs that have allowed our business to grow and thrive and develop from decade to decade and generation to generation. And that's where I'd like to get started here this morning, is I want to rewind the clock back to 1901 and talk a little bit of the history of our family and our business. So the picture that you see on the screen here, this is the original 80-acre farm where you're seated here today that my great-great-grandfather Lawrence purchased back in 1901. At the time that he purchased it, it was still wooded, and so he had to work to clear the land in order to grow a crop and provide for his family. And so he ran the day-to-day -day family farm then for about uh, three decades, looking ahead then to 1937, 1937 is the year that our family business officially got its start. There was this new development back in 1937 called hybrid seed corn. And there was a partnership program through Purdue University where any farmer could go and get three acres worth of this new thing called hybrid seed corn. And so Lawrence and his son, my great-grandfather great Francis, each went to Purdue and got three acres worth of this hybrid seed corn. And so six acres of, of uh Corn production was the start of our family's business back in 1937. Now, the picture that you see on the screen here, that is Francis and Lawrence together, was taken in 1938, just prior to Lawrence passing away. And so the better part of the next three decades or so, Francis was the one who was running the business and running the family operation. Fast forward then to 1965, here's an aerial shot of what the family farm looked like in the mid-1960s. A couple interesting facts about 1965, that's the year that my dad was born. It's also about the same time that my grandpa Sonny came back to the farm. He had finished up at Purdue in 1964, and so by 1965 he had been back in the business for about a year and was bringing some new innovative thoughts and ideas such as hosting the first field show and practical farm research. Let's go another generation then to 1998. This is a, a map of our marketing area in 1998, and you could see at that point in time, we were still a primarily Indiana company. We had expanded our marketing area to encompass the entire state, as well as just a few bleed-over counties into the neighboring states. 
By 1998, my dad had been back in the business for about a decade. He finished up at Purdue in 1987, and I was four years old. Okay, now let's go forward another couple decades to a map that I showed you last year, 2021, to show you the expansion that took place over the next 20 or so years. So here's the map that I showed you last year of what we had identified as our marketing area, which is everything in green, and then the gray areas is what we had, we had thought, well, we might have an ex opportunity to expand there in the future. You can see tremendous amount of growth and expansion that has taken place in the past couple of decades, but that even happens uh, pretty quickly as well. And so I want to share with you some of the things that we've done just in the last 12 months. The first being a Coon Rapids, Iowa corn production location. So not only will that help to serve farmers in Iowa, but also Minnesota, South Dakota, and it'll also really help us in our next expansion, which we announced last November into the entire state of Nebraska. Not only Nebraska, but the western two-thirds of Kansas. So we've been selling in, in Kansas and the eastern third of the state for about four or five years. Now we've opened the doors uh, to the entire state of Kansas. So growth and expansion can happen pretty quickly around here. But that has to be fueled by something. And that takes me to a chart that shows our last 30 years of sales growth. And remember, I showed you the map of 1998 in our marketing area. And so that's represented down here in the left-hand side of the screen. That's our sales activity back in 1998 when we were primarily an Indiana company. You can see near exponential growth that's taken place over the last 20 years or so. So much so that that bar on the far right-hand side of the screen, 2022, now for the first time represents over 10 million acres worth of Beck seed being sold. So tremendous growth, tremendous accomplishments that we've seen. But just as our expansion efforts have to be fueled by sales growth, there has to be something that fuels the sales activity. And that brings me back to beliefs. Things like honoring God, serving others, our mission of helping farmers succeed, a team that shows up every day with a positive attitude and a strong work ethic, those are the things that have allowed our business to thrive in its first 85 years. And I think those are the things that must stay the same as we look to the future and we remain a family-owned and family-run business for the next 85 years. And so that's a little bit of our history, a little bit of the things that I think need to stay the same. I'm going to ask my dad now to talk about some of the things that have changed or maybe will change in the future. Thanks, Corey. Yeah, for 85 years, we've certainly lived through many decades and generations of change. And when Corey shared with you the story about my grandfather and great-grandfather and how they planted that first six acres, you know, they didn't use a tractor. They had a horse, right? A horse and a two-row planter, and they harvested that crop by hand. Well, we wouldn't have a business today if we hadn't advanced and changed a little bit, right? Same with many of your operations. And when I think of planting corn, I, I think back about my childhood, and, and one of the things that my dad taught me to do was to plant corn. And he taught me to plant straight rows, and I got pretty good at it. And so as I started having children, uh, one of my goals was to teach my kids to plant straight rows as well. And I distinctly remember the, the day that Corey and I were out in this test plot right out here, and I'm running the planter, and I'm thinking I need to teach Corey how to plant straight rows. And as I'm thinking that, I'm showing him where to push the auto steer button. <laughs> my life experience had not caught up to the technology we were using, so really my, my passion for planting straight rows was no longer a necessary skill to teach my kids. Technology could help them do that. So change is inevitable, and my dad told our employees uh, back in 2011, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance a lot less. So we have to change. But just as Corey said, the more we change, the more we must stay the same. Uh, those things are fundamentally true for our desire to honor God in our business, our mindset of helping others, and how we go about helping farmers succeed. That's on the relational side, but on the business side, something that I believe has been in the past is true today and also needs to continue is that we want you as our customers to feel like when you buy seed from Bex, you are getting the best value per dollar spent. 
Now, do we have any people in the audience that are President's Club members? In other words, you plant 100% Beck seed on your farm. Okay, quite a few of you. You're receiving that best value per dollar spent. Any newcomers in the audience here at the Becknology Days for the first time? Okay, a few of you. And how many of the rest of you then don't plant 100% Becks? So here's a question I want to ask you. How do you know, or how can you leave today knowing that Bex is your best value per dollar spent? Well, there's really only one way, and that is when you talk with your dealer, your seed advisor, or when they show up on your farm sometime in the next few weeks, don't let them leave you without giving them a quote for your whole farm. Because a quote for your whole farm means that you're getting all of these benefits, farm server, Farm Server is the digital platform our team has created that allows you to collect, safely store, and use your data. Things like practical farm research that you're seeing here today. You can gain knowledge and insights on products and practices that we don't even sell to apply to your operation. Things like commitment rewards, where when you leave here today, you could actually drive home in a new pickup truck or bring, take a seed tender home. Those are the type of things that add working capital to your operation because you're not having to spend extra dollars for those. You're getting them in the price of your seat. When Corey came back a few years ago, about four and a half years ago, his first role was as our seed enhancement lead. And so he got to spend a lot of time with our seed treatment suppliers, working with our processing team. And so I'm going to allow him to give you the update on Escalate and the things that we're doing different for this next year. Yeah, so, so Escalate certainly is one of the aspects of our business that we know and believe to be the best value per dollar spent. And I want to take you back to 2009. 2009 is when we first introduced the name Escalate to represent our seed treatment. At that point in time, we had been studying seed treatments for the better part of about 15 years. And so we were starting to understand that we're going to have an opportunity to introduce new chemistries, new biologicals, new products into our seed treatment mix and pull some others out. But we wanted a recognizable name that wouldn't change but was understood to be the best value in the industry. And so we established Escalate as that brand name for our seed treatment. And we've certainly had plenty of change over the last 12 or 13 years since we've done that, moving ingredients in, pushing some ingredients out, and we're doing some of that again in 2023 on corn. And so I want to share some of that with you here this morning. We've got three new fungicides and two new biostimulants that are part of our Escalate seed treatment package this year. And that now brings us to a total of eight fungicides, which is an unmatched number as a standard seed treatment in the industry. You can see there in green, those are the new components that we've added this year. Ipconazole is a product that has a proven track record in the industry, tremendous success and disease control on six or seven different pathogens, so we're really excited to bring that into the mix. I mentioned earlier our westward expansion into Nebraska, and so Tebuconazole uh, is a product that has really good control for head smut, where our folks in Nebraska uh, deal with a little bit more of that pressure. Amplitude is actually a combination product. It's a biofungicide and a biostimulant. And so not only does it have disease control, but it also really works as a soil health promoter. Lastly, citric acid is a product that really helps with early season health. And so uh, vigor, germination, emergence, and we're excited to bring that into the mix. So those are some of the changes that we're bringing for 2023 on corn. Moving ahead to soybeans, we elected not to make any changes for 2023. But talking about value, I want to talk about our upgraded treatment offering with SDS, Ilevo, and 2.0. So if you're in an area that may deal with heavy sudden death syndrome or soybean cyst nematode pressure, the opportunity for the upgraded treatment with Ilevo and 2.0 at $10.95 a unit is unmatched in the industry. If you were to go elsewhere and look for that, you wouldn't be able to find even Ilevo by itself for less than $12 a unit. And so going back to best value per dollar spent, it's also important for me to remind you that our Escalate seed treatment comes standard at no additional charge on every bag of Beck seed. So as you think about where you're spending your dollars and where you're grabbing that value, I certainly think that our Escalate seed treatment is the best value per dollar spent. 
So that's a little bit of our changes for seed treatment this year. I want to ask my dad now to talk about some of the ways that we've changed our research testing protocols. Thanks, Corey. You know, Escalate is cer certainly something that we believe for you is uniquely different, uniquely better value. Uh, but what Corey mentioned was, you know, how we do genetic selection and how we go about testing to find the products for all soil types. This map is, uh, <clears throat> comes from USDA data over the last 10 years and shows each county in our marketing area and their, basically their soil productivity level because it's, it measures yield over this 10-year period. The darkest green counties represent the top 10% of the counties in our marketing area for yield and the red counties represent the lowest 10% or so of yield in, yielding counties in our marketing area. And everything in between would be your more of the medium soil types. So we have changed our testing over the last few years because the companies that we source products from, whether it's Corteva, Bayer, Syngenta, BASF, all of those companies uh, have good testing programs. They do the majority of it on the medium and higher productive soils. And we used to do that as well. In fact, you can see on this particular chart where our choice trials were located starting in, back in 2019. Most of our trials were in the high productive soils. And we had the fewest amount of trials in low productive soils. Just four years later here in 2022, we've got about an equal number of plot locations in all three soil types. So that enables us then to, to identify those uniquely different, uniquely better products in all soil types, pair that with our PFR proven practices, uh, different management things and, and products and systems, and suddenly you've got a uniquely different, uniquely better value for your farming operation. Because many of you probably, you, you farm different soil types, right? You've got some really good soils and you might have some that are more marginal and, and less productive. And so we've got the testing program to support those acres along with the PFR practices that can enhance your productivity. Now, when we talk about value, one of the components of value is price. And Corey, in his role with, as a licensing lead for us, deals with all the major suppliers, deals with them on our contracts, talks within our team about what's going on in the industry, and he gets to deliver the pricing message for this year. Can you imagine what we're doing on price? Well, well, I get to be the bad guy. I'm the one who has to share with you that we needed to take a price increase this year, and so prices will be higher along with everything else that you spend money on in your life. And I was always thinking about and trying to understand our business this year and the inflationary pressures that have hit our business and how that's impacted not only us but also our dealers and our customers. I started to gather quite a bit of different data, and so I captured information from USDA. I looked at University of Nebraska, I looked at Iowa State University, University of Illinois, but I settled on some pretty compelling information out of Purdue University. Each spring, Purdue puts out what they call their crop cost and return guide, and that's what I want to share with you here this morning. So if you look at the screen here and follow the yellow line, what this chart shows you is seed cost as a percent of revenue. So go back to 2016, and a farmer was spending about 20% of his revenue to purchase seed. And that was the same story there for about five years, about 18 to 20% of revenue being spent to purchase seed. But look what's happened here in the last couple of years, down to 10% in 2022. So in essence, you could say that a farmer has had his seed bill cut in half in the last couple of years versus historical levels. Now, going ahead even to 2023, assuming a $40 per unit price increase. Now, we've got products that may be a little bit more than that. We've certainly got plenty of products that are not up that much, but using a $40 a unit value increase as an example, as a nice round number, we still end up at about 10 or 11% of seed cost as a percent of revenue. Certainly, commodity markets have played a crucial role in the way that this chart takes shape. I'm assuming that you could sell corn for $6.60 in 2023. Now, some of you may say, well, that's too high. I'm not going to sell my corn for that. Some of you may say, that's actually not high enough. I, I sold some already. Uh, for more than that, because we've seen both sides of it this summer. The important part of the chart is not the $6.60. 
The important part is the trend from 20% down to 10% over the last few years. Now, you might ask the question of, well, what if commodity markets really just fell out of bed? What if they tanked? We'd have to go back to $4 a bushel on corn to get back to the levels that we were spending back in 2020, just a couple short years ago, seed costs as a percent of revenue. The next piece of this that I like to talk about, too, is where incremental value comes from. And this next chart helps to illustrate that. So go back over 100 years, and this is the yield curve that we see on corn. So in over 100 years of data, we're seeing 3.2 bushels per acre per year of, of a gain in yield from genetic improvement and trait development. So as we see that, we even see the curve accelerating faster in the more recent years. So as you talk about value, take over three bushels per acre per year and say they even sell it for about $6, okay? So now you're talking about nearly $20 per acre of incremental value. We know that a bag of corn plants two and a half acres. So take $20 times two and a half. Now you've got $50 a unit of incremental value that's, again, been driven by genetic gain and trait development and improvement. That more than makes up for the $40 example that I used on the previous slides. Pretty compelling information here. Think about where else you might spend your dollars. Where are you spending your dollars on other inputs? When you purchase 28%, you don't get 29%, you get 28%, right? How about your diesel? When you're spending 5 and $6 on diesel fuel, you can't go any further with it. You don't get another bushel out of it. So where does the incremental value come from? I believe it comes from seed. Let me give you one more example, too. What this chart here shows you is seed cost compared to fertilizer cost. And so again, the yellow bar is seed, gray bar is fertilizer. And seed and fertilizer costs were pretty well tied together for several years. Go back to 2016 all the way through 2021, they were pretty tight. Look what's happened in the last year and what we forecast for 2023. Fertilizer now double the cost of seed. So again, thinking about value and where the incremental value comes from, I think it comes from seed and we can continue to provide the best value per dollar spent through your seed purchase. Yeah, as I mentioned before, there's really only one way to know if you're getting the best value per dollar spent, and that is to have us quote your whole farm. Because quoting your whole farm means that you've, you've agreed to be a President's Club member, and a President's Club member gets special discounts, rebates, and special gifts throughout the year that no other customer gets. So, as I mentioned, don't leave here today until you've got that information, and then you can decide whether Vex truly is the best value for your farm. So I want to broaden the conversation and talk about why we're bullish on ag. Uh, we'll talk about things in the world, things about in the broader industry. And the primary two reasons that we're bullish on ag, first of all, deals with people. The fact that there's more people that are in the world today that are no longer living in extreme poverty. The second reason is that we have much more environmentally driven energy policy. I mean, think where we would be today if we didn't have 40% of our corn going to ethanol. Okay, that's a big use of our corn crop. So I want to jump back to people. This map show, or this chart shows historical global extreme poverty rates. Okay, going back to 1820. And in 1820, there were approximately a billion people in the world, and the gray area represents the proportion of the people that were living in extreme poverty. And you can see that was most of the people in the world. Fast forward to the era that we're in, and what do you see? A big change, right? A lot more people, over 7 billion people, and the gray area has actually declined. Only about 60% of what it was back in 1820. So the number of people that are no longer living in extreme poverty has dramatically changed. And what that usually means, particularly for those that are, have been extremely poor, when they get a few more dollars to spend, where do they spend those? Well, they've probably been hungry, so they're going to spend it on more food and then better food. When they can start to afford protein in their diet, that's when we start to see that impact because more of our grain goes into livestock. 
So that's one reason we're bullish on ag, because world population and ability to pay for more food and more expensive food is cha has changed. The second being environmentally driven energy policy. You know, we've all heard a lot about the, the world's goal to reduce our carbon footprint, right? And President Biden has set out a lofty goal for the airline industry to, to by the year 2050, to no longer be using fossil fuels in their aircraft. And I think that's also true for ships. That's a lofty goal, that's, and that's less than 30 years from now. Uh, I'm not quite sure I'm ready to jump on an electric airplane. But that's the way that se things seem to be headed. But he set out a shorter term goal, and that was that he asked the airlines to reduce their carbon emissions by 20% in the next eight years, so by 2030. Well, there's ways that that could be accomplished. I don't know that the airline will take on that goal, but they're certainly moving, moving in that direction because, again, environmentally driven energy policy is is focusing them in that direction. Soybeans is one crop, one oilseed crop that could help solve this problem. Renewable diesel is manufactured from soybeans. It's different from biodiesel. You know, we've been using soybeans for biodiesel for several years now. And the difference is that biodiesel from soybeans has to be blended in. And it's usually blended in at a one or two percent rate to our petroleum fuel. Renewable diesel is different. In fact, if, if you signed up for commitment rewards here at Technology Days and you qualified to, to drive a, a diesel pickup home and you needed to get fuel for that and we had a tank out here full of renewable diesel, well, you could fill your tank up with 100% renewable diesel and drive home and you'd be just fine. So it's 100% replaceable for petroleum fuel. Same is true of sustainable aviation fuel also can be made from soybeans. And California has a low carbon fuel standard that they've been discussing and, and may get implemented. And the degree that that gets implemented will help determine the, the amount of soybeans and other oilseed crops that go into these things. All right, what, what else is behind this environmentally driven energy policy? Well, big oil is behind it. So imagine, a few years ago when, when ethanol first started to be talked about. You think the big oil companies were supportive of ethanol initially? I don't think so, all right? Because a gallon of ethanol displaces a gallon of their, their fuel that they've drilled for, all right, drilled oil for. But when they knew that this environmental policy was gonna be shifting the demand in that area, they bought ethanol plants. The same is true today. A year ago, Chevron announced a $600 million investment in different soybean processing partnerships for renewable fuels and other products. There's only about six facilities in the U.S. and Canada uh, that are in production for renewable fuels and sustainable aviation fuel. But look at what's being planned. There's over 20 that are now being planned throughout the United States places where they can process crops like soybeans that we grow and you grow. And so another way of looking at this is how many billions of gallons per year of renewable diesel are we currently producing and using? Well, this shows the production since 2010, and you fast forward just 12 years later in 2022, and we're producing, we have existing capacity of just under a billion gallons a year. Now, that's not a that's not a very large percentage in terms of the gallons of total fuel used. But under construction is another billion. And in just two years from now, in 2024, that's over five billion that could actually be in process and in operation. So the point here is not exactly how much is going to be produced, but it's the trend. And it's a trend that we've seen over the last 10 years as we look at how soybean oil has actually been used in the United States. You can see the, the green bars represent food, feed, and other. And that's the major use of soybean oil, food, feed, and other. And that really hasn't changed for the last 10 years. Exports is another use. That's the gray bars. And you can see the last three years, it's actually declined 
we're not exporting as much soybean oil, largely due to what's the additional soybeans being grown in South America and also our trade tariffs and issues with China. The only growing segment of soybean oil is biofuels, and that's the, the yellow bars. So it looks to me like this trend is saying that in the next few years, soybean oil used for biofuels is going to be the major usage. Now, I don't know, I don't know for sure if we'll go in this direction, but I, I think that if things continue to line up from an environmental energy policy standpoint, that U.S. farmers could be producing more acres of soybeans in the next few years than we do corn. The trend looks like it's going that way. So another, another reason that we're bullish on ag and, and commodity prices, particularly in the shorter term, has to deal with supply. This chart shows the global per capita stocks of the major grains, corn, wheat, barley, sorghum, soybeans, on a global perspective. And 2021 is the red bar on the end, and that shows that we were at a relatively low position, much like 2012 in 2021. And so whenever you have lower stocks, prices tend to stay higher. Another reason is the conflict in Ukraine. And before the war, um, uh, Ukraine was exporting a significant amount of our major grains, wheat, barley, corn, rapeseed. And so when that market got disrupted and we have less grain going into the channels, then again, that helps to keep prices on the higher side of things. So that, those are the few reasons why we're bullish on ag and bullish on commodity prices, uh, both in the long term and in the short term. And we're also bullish on our family business. Now, our fi family business is not much different than yours in the terms of each family member having unique gifts and skills. In fact, Proverbs says, a man's gift makes room for him. And so I'm going to invite Bethany Grimmel, our Director of Culture and Brand Experience, to come up on the platform, along with a few other family members that you may not have met yet. And she's going to lead us in a family discussion. All right, good morning. It is wonderful to see you all this morning. Thank you, Scott and Corey, for sharing with us. And thank you for being with us. We enjoy uh, Technology Days every year. We look forward to see familiar faces that have been with us in the past and then certainly new faces also. So as I was preparing for this panel, it hit me that um, actually this week is 13 years that I have been um, <laughs> an employee of Bex Hybrids. So uh, 13 years ago, I had no idea how good of a decision that I was making. But I think anytime you're in a relationship for that period of time, it's very easy to take the other party for granted. Um, and so I think it's important that we remember not all family-owned businesses are the same. This is a really special uh, family-owned business that creates a different experience for us as employees, for our dealers, for our customers. Mm -hmm. And it's because of the people here to my right. So the foundation of everything that happens here is built by the Beck family, and the rest of us have the opportunity to just build upon that. So we have a, a great uh, moment here this morning where we get to hear from five members of the Beck family. We're gonna open up a conversation and see just a little bit into the heart of the family behind the business. So um, today there are 26 living family members. We will soon have 27. Um, any day now, it will be Sonny and Glenda's third great-grandchild, and then Scott and his wife, Chantel, their second granddaughter, uh, is expected to arrive to hit the ground. So we're excited to see that uh, happen here over the next few days. Would you please join me in welcoming Scott, Corey, Erica, Sonny, and Glenda Beck. Okay, so some of these questions, our marketing team went out to our social media channels and invited questions from the social media world to ask the Beck family. Some of these questions came from um, those channels, and so we're gonna kick it off here. Actually, I apologize, we're gonna do a couple of introductions. Scott and Corey, we got to hear from um, here this morning, but we're gonna ask Erica, Sunny, and Glenda to do it. Just a brief introduction, your name, and then your role in either the business or the family. Erica, we'll start with you. I'm Erica, and I am Corey's wife. We have a six-month-old daughter, Blair, and we have been married for three years. 
Hi, I'm uh, Sonny Beck, uh, title is the CEO, and uh, my current role uh, refines a lot around the production side, the processing side, uh, the uh, uh, thinking ahead about what, what future projects we might want to have, and that, of course, involves the facilities department. So, thank you. I'm Glenda, and I'm the wife to Sonny for 60 years, which has been a pleasure. And I guess I'm the parents of uh, Scott, uh, Kim, and Tony. And then we have all the other grandchildren and great ones, which we're excited about. My part in the business is I'm not as busy as I used to be, but I still do some things like um, sign your checks. <laughs> the, 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 the woman controls the money bags in all of our places, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're going to start with you, Scott. If you would tell us how the family values have contributed to the success of Bex today. Well, when my wife, uh, Chantel, and I first started having children, uh, we, we recognized that we needed to be intentional with them in terms of uh, getting to know them, what their passions are, and, and uh, so we were invested in their lives early on. And then as they got older, we um, started to invite them into different areas of the business to work in the summers and sometimes weekends or throughout the, the winter, winter months. And as they got that experience working in different departments, some of it was things that I chose for them to do, like pulling weeds in our organic plot. And some of it, as they got older, they got to pick a department that they might have interest in. So that exposure and that intentionality, I think, was part of what uh, helped to set them up to know whether they wanted to be back as part of the business or if they wanted to work someone else, somewhere else. Sunny, I'm actually going to ask you the same question. You have a set of values as a family that you also have brought into this business. How have those values contributed to the success of Bex today? Sunny? The set of, the set of values uh, for the company, basically, uh, it's kind of like all of our farm operations, uh, your farm operations, is that you, you like to have uh, uh, the children perhaps come back uh, and be with you on the farm. And so when you set those, the, the values, it, it's okay. It's faith, family, and farming. And those are the three values that we honor and uh, look to as we uh, think about bringing back children into the farm, grandchildren, and also as we look at employees. So those are the, the standards, and, and those transform into then helping farmers succeed. And so those are the real values that we make decisions by every day. Corey, you made the decision in 2018, I think it was January of 2018, to come back to the family business. You were in a career that you loved and that you were really enjoying. I can't imagine it was an easy decision to return home. What led you to make that decision? Yeah, so I decided to come back and join our family's business four and a half years ago in January of 2018. And at the time, I had been coaching college football down at Duke University uh, and living in North Carolina. Prior to that, uh, during my undergrad years at Purdue, I was serving as a student coach for the f football team there as well. So I grew up an avid sports fan, competitor, uh, but particularly football and had a strong passion around that. And uh, it was, you know, be me being down at Duke University was really kind of twofold uh, in some respects. We, we've got, uh, you know, some family rules or guidelines or suggestions that, you know, if you think you may want to come back and work for the family business, you really ought to have the experience of working for somebody else and doing something else for someone else in a different business, different industry. So I, in, in some respects, I was kind of fulfilling that, but really uh, the, the big piece of it was I had a passion for football and felt like that might be my life's work is coaching football. And in my time down there uh, at Duke, I quickly realized you know, it's probably not what I want to do long term. And so as I began to understand that and think about next steps, I started thinking about the opportunity that I have here to work alongside family and then with employees that are like family. And you know, we've, got, we've got several employees that have been here for 
20 and 30 and 40 years. And so people that I grew up with, as I was running around technology days, eating donuts and popcorn and pulling weeds in the organic plot, all of those things. So uh, it, was, it was not a decision that was based on any one job or one thing that I was really excited about coming back and doing. It was really the big picture and the opportunity to come back and be a part of something that we have here that's pretty special. We're glad you're here. And there was some divine intervention that took place. So you returned home, and not too long after you came home, you met your now wife, Erica. <laughs> and Erica shared a little bit about Blair. Blair is your six-month-old daughter. How has having Blair changed your life perspective? Yeah, so I, I got a really similar question down at Henderson, Kentucky, uh, not on the panel, but just somebody that approached me and asked that same question. And I just told them that, you know, leading up to uh, Erica giving birth to Blair, it was, I knew it would be fun. I knew having a daughter would be just a tremendous amount of fun, but I didn't really realize how fun. The, the amount of joy that she has brought to our life has been uh, just immeasurable. And as I think about perspective, you know, the, the biggest thing for me is, is something that I never thought of as a kid. It, it, it never once crossed my mind. And even in our first couple years of marriage, I, I really never considered. But just the amount uh, of, of change and um, just the, my respect for, for women as they go through pregnancy and bringing a new life into the world, uh, their dedication and sacrifice and the work that they put in and what, what Erica did um, – to allow me to become a father is something that is really special. And so I would just say my, my perspective and my admiration and respect for, for women as they bring life into the world has certainly changed. We like to tell Corey and Erica that the only reason they can say having a six-month-old is fun is because they have the perfect baby. Since she was like three or four weeks old, she slept all night long. So for the rest of us that have gone through that endangered servitude of not sleeping for months on end, we're rooting for a second child that just wrecks havoc in their life. So. <laughs> and unfortunately, she's started to teed this week. So she's been a little fussy here at Technology Days. And Erica has kicked me in the shins a couple times. But. <laughs> okay, Glinda, you mentioned that 60 years of wedded bliss is what you and Sunny have celebrated this month here in August, August 12th, I think, to be exact. So first of all, congratulations. That in and of itself is just an amazing feat. But to stand by his side, to raise a family, and to support him as he and you and your entire family have grown a very large family-owned business is pretty remarkable. Those of us that know you, we know that you're really special. For those of us that don't know you, the obvious question would be, how in the world have you done what you've done? Well, I think as a, a young bride coming into a business that we had, of course it wasn't as big as this is today, but as we grew, um, I still knew Sonny's passion was for, uh, he's just pretty seedy person. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, I think some of the things I know that he loves to do is, is after work, just get in his truck and drive the fields and look at the corn. And I often go with him too. And I think those are special times because I know he loves it. And um, I wanna go beside him and to help him to enjoy that part of what he does at Bex. Um, yeah, there's, you know, he spends lots of hours working for you to improve um, everything that we have here at Bex. So I admire that, and um, I just can't do anything else but support that. So my idea of a good date is, <laughs> to, is for her to ride along with me in the pickup truck looking at fields <laughs> and how the corn's growing. And uh, she's kind of she's kind of grown to like that a little bit, so it works. Except for the few times when he would ride out on his motorbike and he would get stuck in the fields and call me to come and dig him out. Yeah, well, who else I gonna call? <laughs> you know, your love story is pretty sweet right now, but I heard a rumor that the first eight hours weren't as glamorous. In uh -huh. fact, maybe you might have considered an annulment yeah. in those first eight hours. Is that true? Well, I thought about it, but then I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there something that happened that led you to think about it? Uh, on Sundays in the afternoon, the various churches uh, had 
softball teams that they played each other, and Sonny was uh, representative on, in his uh, in the church. And so the week before, on Sunday before we were to get married on the 12th, he was playing, and he slid into third base the wrong way and ended up breaking his leg. So um, I took him to a doctor in Arcadia, our town over here, that happened to be open on Sunday. And so he looked at it, and he sent him to the hospital and said, well, I think you better get an x-ray. So the news came back. Yes, he broke it. The doctor thought it was severe enough that he needed a full cast. Sonny didn't agree with that, <laughs> but the doctor put on a full cast. <laughs> and so um, we got married on the next Sunday, and he was going down the aisle in crutches. So um, we actually had to change our honeymoon plans. Um, some people at the church had a, a cottage up in Michigan, so we drove up there. Well, I drove because he could drive. And about halfway up there, we heard this thump, 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 and pulled over the side of the road, and we had a flat tire. So he got out, went over and sat on the side of the road, and I got the tire out and was trying to change it. And this nice, kind semi-driver saw this damsel in distress, so he pulled over in front and came back and offered to change the tire. And you know what Sunny said? No, she's fine. She could get it. <laughs> she, uh, she, she's a farm girl. She can get it. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to let you say that. She, she came pretty close to Noma at that point in time. Uh, I got down on my hands and knees and begged, you know. So we made it 60 years after that. But I will tell you, that's the only tire I've changed. So please don't call me. You know, maybe I, I might not be able to do it that well. So. You have a little halo over your head, Glenda. You are a little angel here on earth. So thank you. Sunny, it's pretty special. You have three generations on the stage with you here today. I think any of us that come from a family business, a family farm, um, this is a dream, you know, for us to be able to build a family business alongside our family and then to pass it on to future generations. What advice would you have for us as we look to create opportunity for the next generation? I think it's very real goal of uh, most farms and um, a lot of kids that grew up on the farm to be able to come back and because uh, you got to do all those fun things. You got to drive tractors at a young age, even pickup trucks. And uh, I remember Scott uh, following me home uh, with the planter uh, one day. He was eight years old and he had the pickup truck. And a neighbor later told me, said, how did you get that pickup truck to drive by itself? <laughs> <laughs> so, but we all enjoy those kinds of things, you know, and so a lot of kids, you know, want, it, want that kind of life. Well, what, what you, when you look back, how many family-owned businesses of any sort last more than about three generations, maybe four? Like, the number is like one-tenth of a percent that lasts a four or fifth generation. And so it was a personal goal of our family and myself. Could we do something different? Could we, uh, could we be able to have a family-owned company that continued on and on and on? Well, the first rule is that we won't sell the business, okay? So that the, the corpus of it will be here. Uh, and so then, do you want all? We have 13 grandchildren right now and uh, going on, and, 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 and some great-grandchildren, okay, two to be exact, with three maybe at this week. So how do you, uh, will there be a place for them, or will they have the passion? Ah, passion. If you don't have a passion for your job, you shouldn't be in it. Uh, my dad taught me that uh, when it was only six of us employees, and one employee was always just negative about everything. No matter what we were doing, just negative. And the rest of it's just like, come on, have a little fun. Have, you know, enjoy doing something. So finally, Dad said to him, I see you don't like this work. If you cannot learn to like it in the next few weeks, whatever, I'm going to help you find another job. So, and he did, because he just, just did not have a passion or, or like the work. And so you got to find your passion in life 
and then you can never work a day in your life. My dad never worked a day in life, and I say I, I haven't either because I, I enjoy what I'm doing. I enjoy everything I'm doing about farming, literally. And so with that in mind, how would you bring on the next generations? So our three children, we suggested, and kind of pretty strongly suggested, they must find another job, must find a couple of jobs before they can come back and apply for a job here. And now that still applies to all of our 13 grandchildren, of which Corey was telling his story. Uh, so the suggestion is that you must go find someplace else to work. Does it say you've got to work two years and then you're good to go? No. You can work two years someplace and never learn what you need to learn. What you need to learn is about where is your passion. You need to learn whether you, uh, where the worst bosses are. Let me say it in a plain English. You need to learn that there's a worse boss in the world besides your dad and your grandpa. <laughs> That's it. You know, when you've accomplished that and you've kind of found out some things about yourself, uh, are you a heads down person or are you a heads up person? In other words, we have jobs and some of our employees here, they might be working in accounting. It's somewhat of a heads down job. You're working with numbers and, and computers, on the computer a lot during the day, that's a heads down job. And I find if somebody is there and they're not happy with that job, I say, what do you do on weekends? Oh, well, I get out and, and I'm, I like to mow the lawn. Uh, I got a horse, I, I ride my horse. I just spend the whole weekend outdoors out and I like to talk to people and whatever. Like, okay, I don't have to fire you because you're not doing good in accounting here, but maybe you could be doing something over here where you're selling or talking with people or maybe you're out on the farm. In the same way, the other way. And so you, you gotta find what that passion is. And so that's what grandchildren have to learn is where's their passion? Like, if Corey had not gone and chased his passion of liking football and maybe being a college football coach, he would have always looked over the fence on a bad day here and said, I wish I could have. I wish I could have tried it. What you want to do is find, give, give your children, your grandchildren a chance to find out where their passion is. And if it's off the farm, okay. You're better off that they chase their passion. I use the story that we have 13 grandchildren, and maybe one of them will have a little music ability and be a professional pianist. It's going to be a long time before we need a professional piano player here, probably, okay? So that's my suggestion, is try to let go let your kids, let your grandkids go find what their passion is and then try to find a place for that in your farming operation or your business operation. Thank you. For the record, I've had the opportunity to work for both the dad and the grandpa boss, and they're two of the best bosses I've ever had. So I know you're not surprised to hear that. But thank you for being with us here this morning on the stage. Would you help me in thanking the Beck family for sharing? Thank you.